all of these advances are converging in a way that if we keep talking at four year increments, the pace of progress is gonna be like substantially greater per unit time. We've already witnessed that. I mean, it's, there's no question that four year increments over my career, that's, that's been true. Um, it's reflected just in, in approval of drugs by the FDA uh, for cancer. But, but now the convergence of diagnostics and therapeutics, um, that's what's finally coming into view. Um, that, 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 that piece has really, I would say, been largely missing. Hey everyone, welcome to The Drive Podcast. I'm your host, Peter Atia. Hey Keith, great to be back with you again. Hard to believe it was uh, almost exactly four years ago that we sat down in Boston to uh, do what will be part one of this discussion. Um, but you know, we've got a lot more listeners now and you know, it's not like some of that content uh, isn't still relevant today. So we'll, we'll probably talk a little bit about some of the things we spoke about then, but there are a number of things that I'm excited to discuss with you that we haven't talked about. Um, and I suspect that will make up the lion's share of our discussion. So thanks again for making time. Yeah, thanks, Peter. It's a great pleasure to talk with you again. And yeah, you're right, four years, a lot has happened. Um, you know, in therapeutic development, maybe you could have said four years ago that some of the things that have played out would have played out. But on the diagnostic side, that's I think that's probably where um, I, four years ago, I, I was, I didn't quite have the crystal ball vision as to how things would, um, would develop there. So, and of course those two areas are like tightly related in oncology. So excited to dig back in. Well, let's just start, maybe give folks a, a, a short background, a little bit about, about what you're doing and, um, you know, why it is that you're at least in my view, in a great position to, to kind of talk about, cancer in a way that is uh, more than just an inch wide and a mile deep, which is the general nature of the field, but, you know, several inches wide, maybe, and and, and, <laughs> right. and, and several, you know, and a mile deep. Like, what, what is it about yeah. your background? Yeah, right, right. I'll try to hit some highlights here that uh, make that point. So, um, yeah, so I'm a medical oncologist. I've been in the field now for 23 years, um, which is a, a, a relevant number because of the fact that um, the first translation of molecular insights, you know, specifically genetic insights into cancer biology, you know, really became therapy starting that year. That's when Amat Nibber-Gleevec like was first in patients and was, you know, kind of a revolutionary moment. Um, so my, my, my career, you know, kind of you know, started right then and there. Um, myself interested as a medical oncologist in trying to translate science to medicine in, a, in very much that way, like taking insights in terms of the genetic makeup, like the mutations um, and then sort of mutational architecture, if you will, of cancers and trying to translate that understanding into therapy. So I've been doing that for 23 years. Uh, like anybody in the academic medical world and oncology, um, I had focused on like specific cancer types, so melanoma and kidney cancer. And both of those I chose because of, because of the molecular insights that existed at the time that felt like they were um, at least beginning to be ripe uh, for translation. Uh, so I did that work for about a decade at University of Pennsylvania, moved to Mass General, um, part of the Harvard uh, University, uh, you know, kind of umbrella, Harvard Medical School, um, to build a clinical program focused on therapeutic development much more broadly across cancer. Um, and then I think as we'll talk about this interplay between therapeutics and, and molecular understanding and ultimately diagnostics, basically built um, a translational research group or, you know, surrounding therapeutic development, um, what I refer to as bedside to bench translational research to sort of understand um, mechanisms of action, mechanisms of resistance, in other words, when drugs work, why, and if they don't work, you know, why not, and use those insights to try to kind of accelerate or drive the whole process forward. And then I'll just like, you know, throw in um, also that over the past 10 years, um, I've co-founded now a handful, uh, a little bit more than a handful of biotech companies uh, with Loxo Oncology being the first, 10 years ago when I was acquired four years ago and Scorpion Therapeutics being the most recent. Um, and I'm actually sitting in the offices of Scorpion Therapeutics at the moment. Um, and so, uh, yeah, like basically that, you know, it's, it's uh, through those channels, um, I guess I would say it's my job to keep, you know, a, a steady eye on like new therapeutic concepts that, you know, could be ready for prime time um, to move forward and then Again, trying to translate my understanding into you know th tools that we can actually use for real patients, aka diagnostics. 
And, and Keith, I think you know it's it's always worth repeating to folks what it is about cancer that's um, as far as the big four chronic diseases. I call them the four horsemen in my book. There's something about cancer that's particularly damning, which is when you look at the other two chronic diseases that are huge killers, which are cardiovascular disease and neurodegenerative disease. They increase in their severity uh, exponentially as you age. And they don't really become a dominant source of mortality until people are in the seventh and eighth decade of life. And that's not true for cancer. Um, in fact, I, I have a little table in front of me that I had one of our analysts pull together that I think is just, we'll put it in the show notes. It's very powerful, right? So it's sort of looking at people in 10 year increments, so from 25 to 34, 35 to 44, et cetera, all the way up to you know north of 85. And it lists the percentage of people in each age category that die in response to cancer. And here's what's interesting is that number peaks in the middle, right? So at 25 to 34, it's 6%. 35 to 44, it's 13 percent. Think about that for a minute, right? That, that is a staggering number for people so young. By the time you get up to 45 to 54, it's 23 percent. 55 to 64, 30 percent. 65 to 74, 31 percent. And then paradoxically, it begins to come down after that because those other diseases are taking off. Another way to look at this is where does cancer rank in cause of death for all causes by decade. And if you go in those same buckets, starting at 25 to 34, it goes from third, third, second, first, first, second, third. In other words, it's mm -hmm. always first to third. There is no other disease that always ranks in the top three cause of death for every age. That's it, full stop, period. It's cancer. And so, you know, it's, uh, it's the second leading cause of death overall. We can talk a lot about those stats, but there's nobody who's listening to this podcast whose life has not been affected by cancer. That wouldn't be possible. I, I, don't, I don't think you could come up with an example of someone who doesn't know someone who's at least had cancer uh, and very likely died as a result of it. Yeah, no, that's a good reminder. I mean, you know, one interesting thing, maybe just to um, break that data down a little bit, is, you know, people... You know, think of pediatric cancers. Um, of course, those are like you know, if, if you, if you, if your life has ever been touched by a kid um, with cancer, there's like just like just almost nothing more jarring. Uh, you know, almost seemingly unjust, if you will, about a child um, being diagnosed with cancer. For children, it cancer is quite rare. So like it, it really occupies an enormous amount of mind share. But then, as you go into the decades that you were um, summarizing. You know, what's interesting is to reflect on the cancer types, uh, you mm -hmm. know, that kind of lead the way, um, right? So brain tumors, leukemia, uh, melanoma, the, one, you know, this, the most de deadly form of skin cancer, you know, one of the cancer types I mentioned that I've been focused on my career, uh, career long, um, you know, that really jumps up you know, in those 20s, 30s, 40s. Um, those cancer types kind of lead the way in kind of the younger population. Um, and there's some interesting implications there in terms of like, well, what causes those cancers and, and why are, you know, some people, uh, you know, so vulnerable to them. Um, and then, you know, carcinogen induced cancers, well, melanoma, of course, is there's a carcinogen called ultraviolet uh, light. <laughs> That's a carcinogen for skin cancer, including melanoma. Um, but like smoking related cancers, for example, you know, those really start to jump up um, in later decades. Um, and then you've got... Um, so, like, you know, just I mean, everybody's aware of this, but obviously, lung cancer leads the way there. But there's there's a, a smoking footprint for a bunch of other cancer types that people don't think about so much. Head and neck cancer is one that I think is, you know, relatively not top of mind for people. But you know, even when you get to bladder cancer, which you think, oh, how does smoking cause bladder cancer? But and it's not the sole cause, but it's certainly a, a big contributor. Um, you know, these sort of smoking-related cancers, um, they do they take exposure, right? <laughs> obviously, and and a bit of time. Um, to accumulate their population impact, um, ultimately. And I guess the other, just one other thing that I would kind of throw in there, because I'm sure we're going to talk about, like, you know, the really population prevalent cancers, like, so breast cancer, prostate cancer, lung cancer, colorectal cancer, the big four. Um, so breast cancer and prostate cancer are not related to, well, obviously ultraviolet light or smoking so much. I mean, a little bit of smoking influence on, on breast cancer risk. But um, but there, it's um, you know this really interesting interplay between um, 
you know, these, these uh, hormone receptors, uh, you know, c- kind of being hijacked or co-opted in a way. Um, and you think about the way in which those cancers form, I think it, it best fits your, um, you know, kind of this age, like, you know, cardiovascular disease and neurodegenerative disease, I would argue, like, there's, there's something at play there that's similar to these hormone-driven cancers, which are very age-related. So breast cancer and prostate cancer really pick up in those later decades of age. Um, so it's just kind of interesting to reflect on, you know, kind of the how and why different cancers kind of feature um, in those uh, different decades of age. And that, that has tons of ramifications in terms of how we think about screening, which I'm sure we'll get into. Yeah, for sure. So let's add a little more color to that, Keith. So you mentioned the big four, right? So uh, lung being number one. I, I think a breast and prostate is kind of number two and colorectal number four. And then if you add a fifth in pancreatic, you now yeah. account for a little over 50% of all cancer deaths. So, yeah. you know, we'll talk about incidents, but we're going to talk about mortality. And at the end of the day, just five cancers account for half, a little over half of all cancer death in the United States. That's one point I'd make. Second point I'd make that's very interesting when it comes to breast and prostate is on the one hand, we have this clear understanding of the role of hormones. And yet, as you point out, the implicated hormones are actually at their lowest levels when these cancers typically come on board, yeah. right? Yeah. So we talk yeah. about the relationship between testosterone and dihydrotestosterone, DHT, and prostate cancer. And yet when men have their highest levels of these hormones in their 20s, in their 30s, and even in their 40s, that cancer is never to be found. <laughs> that cancer yeah. shows up only when those hormones are long gone. I mean, you know, not gone completely, but of course, greatly diminished. And the same is true with breast cancer, right? We see the incidence of breast cancer going up, but it's not necessarily hitting at the peak level of estrogen in women. There's more complexity to it, but again, it speaks to just how much is going on beyond the surface uh, and the first order thinking. Well, yeah, no, that's a great point. And actually, you know, you're, it's kind of very tempting to insert here kind of a, you know, sort of deep cancer biology, uh, you know, uh, principle. If you look at other cancers than breast and, and prostate, the, you know, the cancer types where we've really gone the deepest in our understanding of what causes them to become cancers in the first place, um, and, and even in terms of translating that in terms of therapies, it's really been around the growth factor receptor um, and downstream of growth factor receptors, like so on the surface of cancer right. cells and then inter- internally. Um, that's where the that's where the action has been, right? Yep. And and it, and and here's the point which you just made about the hormone receptors, um, is that basically cancer cells, quote unquote, figure out how to become independent of the actual growth factors themselves, right? So they basically turn, you know, they, through genetic mutation or alteration, they turn on these um, surface receptors or the immediate downstream um, signaling molecules from those surface receptors, it's mutations there. That's the absolute like nidus, if you will, the hot spot um, of where most cancers, not all, but where most cancers actually get their kind of, you know, kind of oncogenic drive, um, you know, the mutations that, that, that drive cancer. Again, it really analogous um, to the comments you, you know, or, or the, the reality and the comments you made about um, prostate cancer and, and breast cancer in terms of the, uh, you know, the, basically that the circulating hormone levels um, at the time those cancers manifest are low. What's happened is cancer cells have wired themselves in a way to be sort of autonomous or independent of those ligands, but still using the receptors and their downstream consequences to drive. Yeah, and I, and I wonder if there's a parallel between the following observation, which is a, test, a, a, um, a prostate cancer that develops in the presence of low testosterone, all things equal, is a worse prostate cancer. So there's that paper in the New England Journal of Medicine, God, it's probably been 15 years now, that demonstrated very clearly that the lower the testosterone at the time of diagnosis of prostate cancer, the worse the outcome. Very counterintuitive, right? Everybody thinks testosterone is causing prostate cancer when in in fact, what we're seeing is if, I mean, the way, so I wouldn't interpret that to mean testosterone potentially has zero role or that high testosterone is protective, although some have argued that. What I would argue is your point, which is the cancers that grow without the hormone are worse. And yeah. therefore, the parallel, if you will, is the ERPR negative breast cancers are worse than the ERPR Absolutely. positive breast cancers. Those cancers, those typically hormone sensitive or driven cancers, that proliferate, whether it be the initiation or proliferation without their respective hormones, tend to be the, the harder ones to, to combat. That's right. It, it, yeah, I mean, it's basically, um, 
So in those instances, those cancers have actually figured out how to essentially replace the function uh, by virtue of, you know, I, I use language like they figured out, because I, I think you might remember from our conversation. <laughs> yes, we like to anthropomorphize ago. cancer. Exactly, I was just gonna say, I, I love anthropomorphizing cancer. It's just, it's actually from a therapeutic development perspective, it's like the easiest mindset to sort of adopt in terms of thinking about how cancers solve the problems that they need to solve to become cancers. So it's, not, like, it's kind of scary language to use, I realize, but, but when you're trying to then like, reverse that or intercept that, it you know, kind of becomes a little bit useful. So anyway, the point is that there's a constellation of mutations that can, that can turn on um, essentially the downstream pathways uh, from, you know, for example, um, estrogen receptor. Uh, so the, so the, 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 what's driving then a so-called triple negative breast cancer, so lacking hormone receptors and lacking HER2, which is a you know, well-established surface target, a growth factor um, uh, receptor on, uh, on normal cells and, and on, can on cancer cells, including breast cancer cells. For cancer, breast cancers that have figured out how to become ca breast cancer, <laughs> what you see in their um, genetic makeup is that they basically still are, are dependent on the same sort of cellular processes. They still have to kind of you know, regulate the same um, downstream programs. They just do it through a variety of means and ones that become very challenging to directly target. I mean, to like to intercept those. And so the point you're making about breast cancer, I'll just kind of maybe complete a little bit this way, which is you emphasize that their prognosis is better, right? So in other words, before ever talking about therapy, that like those breast and prostate cancers that, um, you know, form and stick with breast cancer because that spreads across younger ages, you know, a bit more than prostate cancer does. Their prognosis is better. So before even coming to the issue of treatment, but their treatability is also far greater, right? Because we've got drugs Yeah, we have more targets, yeah. The, exactly, and, and, and intercepting those, um, uh, you, know, what are we, you know, hormone receptors specifically, which are by the way, inside of cells, just a little nuance to um, separate from the comments I made about sort of the surface growth factor receptors. Those drugs, we've had them for a long time, but also like serious advances have been made applying new chemistry strategies to developing even better and better versions of those. So, so we're actually, so what we're witnessing, um, let me just make this point in relation to pancreatic cancer, which I'm glad you called out, is that um, we, I've, I might have used this term four years ago, we have this scenario in cancer where there's kind of a distribution of haves and have-nots. And what I mean by that is we have patients whose prognosis to start with is better and whose therapy advances are really accelerating and like making certain cancers and hormone receptor positive breast cancer is a, quite a good example of this where like additional drugs now have been successfully developed and it's combinations since we spoke four years ago even. Now FDA approves them on the market. Um, and so the outcomes of those patients just continue to be distanced from cancers like pancreatic cancer where first off, the lethality of pancreatic cancer, right, like per case diagnosed, um, the case fatality rate, so-called, um, is far higher than these other cancers, right? So it doesn't even come close in terms of number of cases diagnosed to breast and prostate, um, or lung for that matter. But, it, but, it, but per case diagnosed, the likelihood that it's going to be fatal ultimately is inordinately high. Um, and so that's both a, that's a prognostic issue, that's, those are aggressive cancers, but also our therapy advances have been like really quite minimal, which is to say all we've got are the, what I refer to as classical chemotherapy drugs of kind of the pre-2000 era, um, which have a modest impact, um, you know, uh, at, at all. So talking about haves and have-nots, pancreatic cancer unfortunately remains very much in that kind of have-not end of the spectrum. Yeah, a couple other points to make just on the broad you know, sort of uh, contours of cancer. Um, one of the other carcinogens we haven't really discussed, which is essentially the second most prevalent um, environmental trigger of cancer after smoking is obesity. Um, and we can certainly debate whether it's obesity per se, which I don't think it is. In other words, I don't think it's adiposity. Uh, I think it is inflammation and growth factors that come with obesity, namely insulin, uh, probably IGF-1, uh, not to mention the inflammation that is part and parcel with that, which I assume is in some way impairing the uh, immune system and, and, and things of that nature. So um, that's another example where you have a lot of these cancers. Let's think of those top five, breast, prostate, pancreatic are clearly linked. Colorectal as well. I'm not sure about lung. So lung might not be as related to obesity as the other four. 
but uh, there are also many other you know cancers that fall outside of the top five lethal where where we do tend to see this relationship uh, to my last count I think there were about 25 26 maybe 27 cancers that have a pretty tight relationship to that so you know yep. that's not only something that's increasing uh, in terms of societal prevalence um, but you might argue that that also takes a while to to sort of yeah. kick in yeah so that's yeah totally right um, yeah, thank you for inserting that because it really is, you know, it's it's so easy to think about um, ultraviolet radiation and skin cancers, so easy to think about smoking. Uh, I mean, now that we understand, you know, when we sequence, uh, you know, an individual cell or a population of cancer cells, um, sequence their genome, and we can now see the you know, the footprint, if you will, the damage um, that those types of carcinogens uh, induce, obesity is unquestionably, you know, like another when really you know, that, that third highest ranking um, quote unquote carcinogen, but the way it does it is, is certainly more complicated. And, and it is, as you're saying, sort of it's systemic. Um, you know, I really do latch on to that literature that you alluded to um, regarding sort of insulin signaling, um, you know, kind of like sort of the, the body's metabolic response um, to, ob to obesity. Um, I mean, even you can study this just in like a fed versus fasted state, like in kind of a short-term um, setting. But but when you're you know someone um, is obese, basically they, there are metabolic you know adaptations, if you will, that the body sort of attempts to make. And I would draw the analogy to you know where we started with um, the hormone receptor uh, you know driven cancers, so you know, breast and, and prostate. Um, it's you know it's a different. Um, phenomenon to a degree, but basically, you know, insulin growth factor, IGF, you alluded to, and then um, its receptors on cells, which are sort of ubiquitous uh, on all cell types, and certainly the, the, you know, the cell types that, um, for which we've got epidemiologic evidence that uh, those cancers are more common um, in the uh, obese um, population. Basically, what, you know, what you can say from laboratory data is that, you know, the, the signaling that happens through insulin signaling in cells, um, it's it's tightly tied uh, to what we have you know kind of talked about already, which is that sort of growth factor receptor you know um, pathway. I mean, it, it really it is ultimately part of that you know sort of same biology. There's a there's a, a pathway that you know, that connects those surface receptors into cells um, that then regulate um, sort of how the mitochondria act as sort of the you know the the power stations, if you in, uh, will, inside of cells. Um, so the so-called PI3 kinase pathway, um, you know, well described as being a driver in cancer. Um, that pathway is basically being chronically driven um, in that setting of high, ins high insulin levels, high uh, insulin growth factor uh, circulating levels. Um, you know, so exactly, you know, what threshold level um, poses risk and over what period of time, like, you know, those, um, I would say those dots haven't been fully connected, but the epidemiology is undeniable, and I would say the laboratory data that supports you know that connection is also undeniable. So I think there's you know there's there's something about you know that that kind of pushing that driving. It's I mean like chronic inflammation as you cited, which itself by the way, of course, is a direct uh, causal factor for certain cancers. Um, yeah, so like a, like a, a organ site or a tissue site where there's chronic inflammation, um, well described that cancers can arise in that uh, in that setting. It's a similar phenomenon, basically. They kind of keep whipping the horse, if you will, in a way, and 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 cells will, you know, ultimately, um, through genetic alteration, still um, basically, you know, respond, uh, you know, to that environmental stress, um, and 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 cancers ensue. So I remember in the in January of two thousand, um, I'm in my last year of medical school, and I uh, trek across the country from California to Bethesda to go and spend uh, four months uh, as a medical student rotating on the immunotherapy service with Steve Rosenberg. And this was the opportunity and dream uh, of a lifetime for me. I had read his book, The Transformed Cell, many, many times as a medical student and wanted to uh, basically go and learn what I could. And um, that the, I, I look back at that, uh, I, I think I was there from January until April of that year. I, I mean, uh, literally one of the most uh you know joyful examples of pure bliss i i had I, i've told the story before <laughs> but i i think i told this story when i had him on the podcast you know i had 
um, found a friend I could stay with in Bethesda, but it turned out in the four months I was there, I was probably only there eight times. Um, <laughs> I, I didn't leave the hospital. I literally had a cot where I slept and I just didn't want to be out of there. And I wanted to be kind of as, as close to the lab, as close to the clinic as possible. But I'll never forget one of the most, um, you know, insane things that he said in the first week that I was there. He said, looking back over the past 30 years, we have basically made no progress in the long-term management of metastatic epithelial cancers. Uh, translating that into English, if you had a solid organ tumor that had spread to a distant site in 1970, the chance that you were going to be alive in 10 years was the same mm -hmm. in the year 2000. And that was basically zero. Now, there were a couple of small exceptions, and they happened to be the cancers that you and he are both interested in. There were about 10 to 15% of patients could achieve a solid durable remission at the time to uh, high-dose interleukin-2, but that was not appearing to be the case for any other epithelial tumor, and there was still absolutely no sense of why that wasn't the case for the other 90% of patients who had mm -hmm. metastatic renal cell carcinoma and melanoma. How are we doing today, 23 years later, um, do you have a sense of how much bigger that number is? So if we went from 0% 10-year survival in 1970, and I'm using 10-year to really try to get out some of the yeah. median survival extension stuff, but if we were 0% survival for a solid organ tumor in 1970, call it 1% in the year 2000 on the back of the you know few cases of RCC and melanoma, what are we at today? Yeah, I think 15% is a conservative number. Um, you know, some would make a case for 20%. I think the problem is there that uh, you need a little bit, we need a little bit more time. Some of the, some of the newest therapies. Yeah, you know, yeah. Only, we don't have the 10 you know, years. On the, on, yeah, yeah. yeah, we don't have the 10 years. Um, but, but if you track their five-year, yeah. you know, three and five-year outcomes, if you will, you'd like to think that, you know, they're, they're going to get us to, to 20%. Um, so that's, you know, again, just to, just to clarify what we mean by um, using this term metastatic. Um, so like clinically overt detectable metastatic cancer means that you're picking it up radiographically or clinically. Like that's right. That's what that, that's what that term means. Right. Um, now, the fact is that cancers are found when they're found at what's thought to be an earlier localized, um, uh, you know, site. Uh, basically, it's, you know, it's very, very common that cancers will have spread to so-called regional lymph nodes, like through lymphatic channels to the closest lymph node basin. Uh, wherever that may be. Um, this is not true for all cancers, but it's certainly true for the common epithelial cancers you're um, uh, you know, focused on in this question. And so basically um, the point to emphasize there is that spread to lymph nodes is properly called metastatic, right? But we just don't use that jar, it's a, it's a jargon term, right? We just, we, we don't actually, we don't talk, think about that um, as being metastatic. Yeah, so the, sort of the analogy, right, is like, um... You know, when people leave a city in an airport and go to another airport that's in another city, we don't call it spread until they leave the airport and go to the city proper, even though right. they've clearly that's demonstrated right. the capacity yeah. to go from their house to the airport, hop on an airplane, exactly. go to another airport, and once yeah. they step foot out of customs and collect their bags, well, now we can say they've really spread. Yeah, that's right. And, and uh, the other point I was just going to quickly make is that it's feasible to surgically remove regional lymph nodes along with the primary um, site of disease in you know, the vast majority of cases. And so because of that you know, sort of historical standard of practice of you know, surgical resection, including regional lymph nodes, um, we think of surgeries that can encompass all of that as you know, basically being you know, one, one treatment. And then those patients are, you know, well, we're going to come to this, I think, probably a little bit further along in the conversation, but you know they are thought to ha not have metastatic disease. But what I mean by that is, you know, overt. So like you can detect it clinically or radiographically. Um, how do we know that some of those people actually have metastatic disease right at that time? Well, by following them five and ten years. Well, not even that long. I mean, one, two, and three years is in fact enough for most of the aggressive cancers. Um, they will, you, know, you do the surgery, you clean the slate, you do scans, you know, of various kinds. You you see nothing. Um, and basically, a substantial fraction of those patients, depending on the cancer type and depending on how much you know, the features of their primary tumor as well as lymph node involvement, a substantial fraction of those patients, let's go with 30, 50 percent, you know, kind of a typical range, um, over those few to several years of follow-up will manifest metastatic disease. Well, they always had it. They had it, they had it from before the surgery was ever done. 
Um, and as you said, basically they actually cancer cells, or, this, or the analogy of the traveler, left the airport. I mean, they actually they you know they did they lodged in a you know distant site. Uh, we just didn't have the methods you know to find it. So time would would tell um, that that in fact in retrospect they had had it. Um, this is where actually some huge advances have been made in terms of um, blood-based detection um, of those instances. Uh, we're not we're not perfectly good at that now, but there have been substantial improvements in the technology for detecting particularly circulating um, tumor DNA um, in instances where people have only microscopic metastatic disease. So that's that's the that's the term I wanted to kind of insert in this conversation is microscopic metastatic disease. Uh, we'll come back to this, but let me let me just you know uh, pick up on this theme again. You know for for evident overt metastatic disease, when you can see it on scans or, or clinically to, um, witness it, uh, that's where those numbers pertain that we're talking about, like you know, getting in this you know, 15 moving towards 20% range. Um, 10% uh, on an absolute scale. So, so like let's, let's go with the idea that we're on the path with available therapies that have just you know, recently been introduced, included towards that 20% number. Half of that advance has come from one therapeutic modality. PD-1 antibody-based immunotherapy. A single approach um, has accounted for half that number. It's astounding. And then what about the other half? Um, that has come from a, a repertoire of these so-called molecularly targeted therapies that intercept you know, those um, you know, genetically altered drivers that I alluded to some minutes ago, um, these surface receptors and their downstream signaling molecules. Um, but you know, th those, have p those individual drugs have picked off you know, as small as 0.2%, you know, of the cancer population um, in the kind of rarest inst instance, up to you know a couple few percent, right? And then, but you add them all up, and those have produced, um, you know, also uh, you know long-term survivors now. I mean, by by historical standards, so that 10 10 year number is like it's an astoundingly long survival by historical standards because metastatic cancer will prove fatal. Um, in nearly everybody, if un untreated, um, you know, within that time frame, even the most "quote unquote" indolent cancer. Yeah. So let's just kind of go back and and restate the important part of that. So um, basically, 1970 to the year 2000, zero progress has been made. 2000 until now, we've probably been able to, um, you know, make a small dent in that. Half of that dent has been on the back of Keytruda. How many, how many drugs are in the other half of that? Like, so we mentioned Gleevec a minute ago. That was probably the first. Yeah, there have been 52, there have been, yeah, 52 FDA approvals, but, um, but that's against 19 unique mechanisms, mm. right? So there's a lot of, me, a lot of me tooism um, in, I mean, this is true in all therapeutics, yeah. not just oncology. Um, and so that's, so look, like, I, I tend to then go down to that number, right? So like 19 unique mechanisms. Um, and uh, and even there, frankly, there's not there's some there's some overlap. Um, so like different molecular targets, but like for the same population, like within a given pathway inside a cell, there's instances where we've actually successfully drugged like one component and its immediate downstream component and the immediate downstream component. Yet again, that would then count as three on that list of 19. But really, they're very overlapping. So if I were to really boil it down, you know, I would we're you know kind of in the ten range um, in terms of you know truly unique yep. uh, molecular targets, uh, and and Keytruda does have company. So this I would you know the, the, so the the target of Keytruda just for those who are trying to keep up with the jargon as they do their their Google searching on any of these topics, the target of Keytruda um, is. P, capital P, capital D hyphen one. That's a surface receptor on certain immune cells, um, particularly on these CD8 positive T lymphocytes that can kill tumors directly, but there are other immune cells that um, express PD-1. And so, and that's a break on those immune cells. So the antibodies that block that break are the so-called PD-1 antibodies. There are five of them that are FDA approved and Keytruda, Keytruda or pembrolizumab is that's the dominant one that made it to market um, well, first and also in the broadest number of cancer populations, um, but there's you know when I said me tooism before, like there's like lots of me tooism in that space. And then um, is CT is anti CTLA four still being used, or is that mostly just being used in melanoma? How how yeah. what's the prevalence of its um, susceptibility versus that of PD one? Yeah, four t four cancer types now, and and most would argue a fifth. Um, have evidence that adding CTLA-4 to PD-1 
as another block. So that's another break on the immune cells, on, the, on those t same T cells. Um, it was actually discovered before PD-1 um, as a target, and, and the therapy was advanced against it um, a little earlier than PD-1. But a much smaller percent of cancer patients get a benefit um, you know, from that drug. Uh, there's some evidence that it, it actually can act kind of independently, uh, you know, sort of exert its own benefit. But, but I, I, I'm ascribing that 10% number, by the way, there, there's some real math behind that. It's not totally like just a gestalt number of patients who get long-term benefit from PD-1. Um, if you add in CTLA-4, you're in the 1%, you know, range yeah. in terms of the, you know, addressable population for CTLA-4 antibody therapy who, who can who derive then yeah. like 10-year type uh, benefit. So PD-1 is doing really, you know, the, the, the heavy lifting. Yeah. I think it's probably worth just sort of explaining immunotherapy again. Uh, again, I, yeah. we have an entire podcast dedicated to that. When I sat down with Steve Rosenberg, you and I spoke about it briefly four years ago. But I think given that the immune system is, uh, I was about to make a joke that wasn't intended to be a joke. I was about to say it's not innate as in our understanding, <laughs> <laughs> but of course it is innate in, yeah. in its in its physiology. Um, but but given that I think that, you know people don't necessarily you know completely understand the nuances of the immune system, given that um, it's played such an important role in cancer uh, optimism over the past two decades, and given that it's probably about to play more of an important role mm -hmm. as we go forward. I think it's worthwhile for the listener and viewer to understand how the immune system works with respect to cancer. Because when we talk about TIL, when we talk about checkpoint inhibitors, which we've already touched on, uh, I don't want people to be lost. Uh, so unfortunately, this is one of those moments in this podcast where you got to buckle your seatbelt up a little bit. Um, yeah. but, it, it, but it pays dividends um, because you become a very educated consumer of, of how these drugs work. Yeah, so let me let me kind of layer the onion this way, um, which is I, I find it most useful, and I'd say this even in talking to patients. Um, so they're you know my my lay audience, uh, if you will, uh, to start with um, you know the concept that, that the immune system needs to find levers that it can grab onto, as in differences, things that are fundamentally different um, than normal cells. Uh, we, we our immune system is trained um, in fetal development um, to to do exactly that, and 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 quote unquote only that, um, except for the fact that we unfortunately hold on to self-recognizing immune cells and those can cause autoimmune disease, which is not the topic of our conversation today. Um, but basically, um, it, so when you consider you know, what's, what's different about cancer cells and what, you know, what have we learned over the decades on that topic, there are a variety of differences. Um, now, I'm gonna start here because it's kind of gives a little bit of chronology in a way. Uh, we, we, we began to understand some time ago that um, a, lot, a common feature of cancer cells is that they behave um, like their uh, sort of progenitors or precursors. Like in development, right, all mature cells in the body come from a, you know, a, well, a stem cell of, you know, of, a, of some sort. Um, and there's lineage and different, different lineages and different types of stem cells. Uh, but ultimately, you see cancers actually adopt sort of a biological behavior that's like backing up, if you will, in the developmental um, process. Um, and this is part of the, just a co consequence of the genetic alterations, sort of the combination lock, as I often refer to it, of genetic alterations that can lead to cancer is that that's one of the programs um, that they typically adopt. And it turns out that developmental cells um, have surface, um, you know, proteins, uh, surface, you know, markers, if you will, that are not expressed in, in uh, uh, fully mature tissues. And the immune system can see those, um, so that's well documented. And Steve Rosenberg's early successes actually were, were you know, uh, identifying uh, those immune cells that existed in people that could recognize, uh, you know, those those types of antigens. So, so these are referred to as cancer testis antigens. So just think of that as kind of this developmental sort of biology. Turns out there are also interestingly some what we refer to as lineage antigens. So like you know uh, surface markers that you know kind of tag. A certain you know cell type that the immune system interestingly can recognize, even though we think of those as being more like self. Um, but you know, we 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 see that we see evidence that that the immune system reacts uh, to those, and that there are you know cell therapies um, as you were alluding to before um, that also take advantage of that. The the big discoveries of the recent you know several years have been that carcinogens cause mutations um, in genes that then you know the, those genes encode first RNA and then proteins, and, and the altered amino acid sequence of the protein 
that can be recognized. So those are intracellular, almost always, um, those, those proteins, but we have a machinery in our cells, all, all cells in the body, um, including those cells that go on to become cancer, that basically breaks down those proteins as they age um, and will present a representative set, if you will, of those broken down protein fragments or peptides um, to uh, you know, present them, meaning on the cell surface, in the context of these um, uh, you know, molecules we refer to as major histocompatibility um, you know, receptors, as they're you know, uh, kind of alluded to. But the idea is that they're, they're, they're trying to show the wares, if you will, the, the inner, inner contents of a cell to the immune system. Um, because we think that because of that is that, that virally infected cells you know, have an infection inside. Um, we think this is how this you know, machinery um, was ever, uh, uh, you know, how it ever evolved in the first place. And so kind of showing the inner contents, if you will, as a way of being able to like, let the immune system know that there's a virally infected cell. Well, that same machinery exists again in every cell. Um, and by the way, if cells stop doing that, there's a branch of the immune system, stop, stop presenting antigens at all. Um, antigen is a new word. I, meant to um, introduce that. Antigen means a difference, like a, a protein fragment that's being presented and seen as different. We call that an antigen, and it can come in these different categories that I'm talking about. Um, so basically, if a cell, if a cancer cell were trying to hide itself, if you will, by not expressing um, these receptors to present antigens, then there's actually a branch of the immune system that's basically, you know, natural killer cells, as they're called. They're very primordial immune cells that are supposed to just you know, swoop in and and kill those cells, and, and we have evidence that that does occur. So, so let's just let's just pause here, Keith, to make sure people are following the anthropology of this. Um, so, basically, you have a row of homes, and each person in their home is responsible for demonstrating the contents of their home. So, they reach inside and they pull out various items from their home, and they leave them on the curb. And the, you know, the military is coming down the street inspecting the contents on the curb. And they're just making sure that it's all stuff that we've pre-agreed is safe, yep. right? right? So That's what right. they know, they don't know the entire repertoire of what could be presented, but they have a very clear list of what is acceptable. And they're basically just identifying anything that is not on the acceptable list. And if anything right. shows up and it's not on the acceptable list, the house is destroyed. Furthermore, if you leave nothing on your curb, either because you're too incompetent or you're nefarious and you're trying to hide what's in your home, there's another branch of the military that comes along and just blows up your house. So failing to play the game <laughs> results in a, in a loss of home. That's right. Yeah, well said. So that so that's the beginning, right? I mean, it's this kind of sampling, if you will, like you said, of the of the inner contents. Um, uh, and and so that that's important to recognize because you know if you kind of start with this core principle that cancer is a quote unquote genetic disease, meaning that mutations that happen in key genes that um, disable cells' ability to repair DNA damage um, as a common um, you know, a feature of cancers, for example, or mutations that activate some of those surface receptors or downstream signaling molecules that we talked about before. Um, those uh, mutations we've learned in recent years can be seen as different. Um, so they like, you know, kind of began to, you know, increase the kind of the toolbox, if you will, um, uh, of handles that the immune system can latch onto. So if you think about it that way, the cancers, you know, um, you know, begin to form potentially uh, if they're witnessed uh, by, you know, the immune cells as having a difference early, uh, we have lots of evidence that they can be eliminated. Um, and I mean, and there's actually kind of the, I guess, you know, uh, indirect, uh, you know, negative evidence, if you will, that people who have profoundly compromised immune systems will pop up with cancers. I mean, if you give people, you know, seriously, you know, high dose immunosuppressive medication for various other medical conditions, you will see cancers just kind of sprout up, um, you know, quickly and then certainly over time as well. Um, this immune surveillance concept is an inordinate amount of evidence um, in support of this idea that at, if at least keeping them down, you cancer, proto cancers down, if not outright eliminating them. Is that's just part of life on on planet Earth? Um, you know, sort of in the cosmic storm, if you will, with UV radiation as being you know one carcinogen I mentioned. Well, actually, gamma radiation <laughs> coming through the atmosphere is is also a, a cause of DNA damage. We have to kind of um, you know try to repair those uh, you know, that damage uh, inside of cells. I mean, when I say we, I'm, I'm again using the anthropomorphic inside of a cell uh, inner workings here. Um, and but you know but if the repair can't happen, we have this other mechanism of immune surveillance, uh, basically to wipe it out. 
So I, what I, the reason why I wanted to just kind of spend enough, you know, kind of words, uh, you know, on this concept is that basically people have to understand that by the time they're diagnosed with cancer, something's gone wrong, right? <laughs> basically, right, like the, the, the system didn't work um, to detect, you know, in this surveillance mode, uh, the forming cancer. It didn't eliminate it. Um, how can that be? Well, it turns out <laughs> that they're, um, you know, for every, you know, kind of process that activates the immune system in response to an infection, just go with that idea that that's like kind of, you know, the primary function of the immune system in terms of how it is that we ever kind of got out of the swamp in the first place evolutionarily. Um, there's a break on the immune system. Like you can't just elaborate immune response, you know, indefinitely. I mean, imagine having the flu forever, like just dumping cytokines or immune system hormones into the bloodstream, you know, cranking up, you know, body temperature, you know, and consuming a ton of metabolic resources in fighting infection and feeling bad as a consequence when you have the flu. You can't do that, like, you know, indefinitely. You gotta stop, you know, immune responses. Um, and so we have, you know, mechanisms to do that. Like it turns out a very elaborate set of mechanisms to do that. And cancers have just ever so craftily figured out uh, how to basically kind of reach into the genetic code, the blueprint, uh, and co-op mechanisms that will basically impede immune system recognition and response. That's the PD-1, PD-L1 story. So PD-1 we've talked about, that's the target of Keytruda. But what cancers do, it's a nasty little trick, um, is they've figured out how to, not all cancers, but, but the ones that are most responsive um, to Keytruda, they have figured out um, how to express on their surface uh, the, the, the foot that presses on the brake, okay? So that's called PD-L1, so program death hyphen L1, ligand one which basically reaches across to PD-1 on T cells and tells them, shut down, basically. Like, mission accomplished, <laughs> don't need to do anything here. Um, and so, you know, a, a, a lung cell, an alveolar lung cell um, that ultimately becomes cancer is not supposed to be expressing that, 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 that protein on its surface, right? It's not supposed to be regulating the immune system. That's like, that's not the, the natural job of a lung alveolar cell. Um, but a cancer that arises from that cell, uh, in many instances, basically, quote unquote, figures out how to express um, that protein. And so then blocking, you know, the interaction of the foot with the brake, like that's the magic. That's, there, there it is. Um, now that's just one mechanism, but as I said, it's actually produced a bigger incremental benefit in the cancer population than any single mechanism we've ever discovered in all of cancer biology research and therapeutic development history. So it's a pretty powerful one. But I'll just conclude with this statement that there are other mechanisms by which the immune system can be suppressed. Um, in fact, there's entire cell types in the immune system repertoire that are, have a dampening effect on immune system response. And cancers can recruit them into their so-called microenvironment and create this very adverse environment for the T cells that could otherwise attack and kill. So it's like almost like assembling a force field by virtue of inviting in these non-cancerous cells, right? They're like, this is like can the cancer cells recruiting in um, these suppressive immune cells. So this is some of what we're up against. I mean, I just want to make it clear how kind of complicated it is. Um, yes, we've, we're super grateful to have had this, you know, kind of eureka moment um, with you know, the success of PD-1 drugs, uh, but, but cancers have co-opted multiple mechanisms by which they defend themselves in terms of you know, trying to close the gap then and use this immunotherapy concept much more broadly in cancer is going to require us to develop the understanding of, okay, well, which tricks are being pulled and how to be able to, you know, really target those very specifically. We can't disable people's immune systems, right? <laughs> like, that's not okay. Um, and so you, we, we do need a fair amount of precision and, um, you know, and, and figuring out kind of the sweet spot, if you will, in terms of what mechanisms cancers uh, are using uh, for this purpose. Of all the things that um, Steve talked about when, when I interviewed him last year, the one that I was most blown away by, which spoke to my time away from the trenches, you know, time away from what you're doing day to day, was that roughly 80% of epithelial tumors had novel neoantigens. Now, again, if you said that at a party, that would go over everybody's head and it wouldn't <laughs> resonate as a particularly insightful thing to say. But in light of what you've just said, let's, let's make sure people understand what that means and how shocking that is relative to where we were 20 years ago. Because 20 years, like just to put this in context, mm -hmm. right? So 
when I finished my time at the NCI and went back to finish medical school and applied to residency, you know, you talk in residency interviews, you're talking about what you're obsessed with and what you're interested in. And I talked a lot, I mean, that my time at NIH was such a formative part of my education. And I can't tell you how many people I interviewed with that just laughed in my face and said, this immunotherapy stuff is nonsense. <laughs> like, it's totally irrelevant. Like, what are you talking about, kid? Like this, you're going to sell yourself to us as an interesting person that we should let into our program. And you're talking about that crap. Like, it literally means nothing. Okay. <laughs> it works on melanoma. Who cares? Right. Okay. Right. Why is the fact that 80% of epithelial cancers have novel neoantigens a, a, a totally staggering feature that had people understood that 20 years ago, uh, you know, maybe more than just a handful of people would have found immunotherapy to be yeah, a, a very promising exactly. field. Yeah, right, right, right. So let, let's, you know, like, let's break that down a little bit, um, you know, kind of the biology behind this. So mutations accumulate in a cell that's going to become cancer. Fair number. I mean, we're talking, you know, never less than dozens in the, you know, the quote unquote most genetically simple ca um, cancers, but you're typically into the hundreds and thousands. Um, and basically, you know, the, uh, not all of those have a consequence. Um, and, he, and to the point about these uh, antigens, so some of them are in parts of the genome that don't even encode proteins, right? So like in which case they're not going to ever become, you know, the, the types of antigens you're alluding to. The ones that are translated into proteins, Again, those proteins age, they get, you know, sort of, you know, broken up in the uh, proteasome presented in the context of these MHC molecules that I referred to before on the cell surface. But that's done differently in each of us. And so basically, they're, like, we don't show our entire wares. We show kind of, you know, selected um, uh, representation of them. In other words, these MHC molecules, you know, you inherit kind of half of your set from your mother and half of your set from your mother, father. Um, they have an ability to grab just certain protein fragments. Um, and present them. Uh, when I say grab, they're like actually loaded onto those um, by a like cellular machinery that's quite uh, elegant. Um, and so the point is, we have this uh, you know this repertoire of showing the inner contents, and so only certain mutated well genes that translate into let's call them mutated proteins or you know just altered proteins. Um, only certain of those can actually be presented out of the very large number of mutations that actually exist. Um, but what is astounding is that, that as you say, 80% of, so when you do epithelial cancers, just remind people, like breast, colon, prostate, lung, The big ones. Pancreas, yeah, all, yeah, it's basically, yeah, it's not leukemia yeah. and lymphoma. Yeah. It's basically. It, or, it's, it's, and, and, brain, and yeah, brain tumors. Yeah, yeah. Right, yeah. Not leukemia, lymphoma, or brain tumors. Uh, and so, uh, and yeah, and mel melanomas, we mentioned before, those, those all, uh, actually come from melanocytes, which are of neural crest origin, which are actually um, share common features with brain tumors. But basically, just to be complete, it's all the rest of cancer. Um, what's astounding is that basically you can find evidence um, that these mutated proteins are being presented um, in the vast majority of these common cancers. And here's the point. We are born with T cell receptors, um, well, born and during early fetal develop or early uh, 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 development after, after birth. We elaborate this, this very uh, impressive repertoire of T cell receptors that you know, sit on the surface of T cells that can recognize exactly these altered proteins, like with just one amino acid substitution uh, present um, in the, the, uh, the peptide fragment. Um, we've got that repertoire. I mean, you can, so this is the, you know, the proof that these antigens are antigens. I mean, like to meet the definition of antigen, you have to find in a human being <laughs> that the immune system can actually see it um, in the context of it being presented on these MHC complexes. And, and it turns out that like this, it's kind of a lock and key concept essentially. Um, that, that it has to structurally work out, that the pre pe protein fragment is being presented, you know, in the T cell receptor docking in um, and seeing that version, but not the unmutated version, right? Like where that difference is enough to basically tell the T cell, go, like kill. Um, yeah, so these exist. I mean, it's like this first began to be described in earnest well, about a decade ago. Um, and then, you know, of course we were sequencing cancer genomes. Um, you know, a, a ton at the time. And we figured out as PD-1 and c 4 were being clinically developed, we began like looking then in retrospect and seeing, you know, it's these tumors that have a ton of these mutations. Um, they're the ones that are responding like much more likely than other cancer patients slash cancer types. Um, and so guess what? It's the ultraviolet radiation associated cancers that have like just enormous amounts of mutations like in total and the presence of 
actually significant numbers, usually oftentimes dozens of these mutated neoantigens. That's the jargon term that we're, we're like coming towards here. Um, and so that explains why the response rates are so high in those cancers. Smoking-related cancers then account for just about all the rest of where PD-1 has been efficacious. So it, like, we didn't know this when PD-1 and C-T4 antibodies were first being developed, that like, it was this interplay that um, we could then like, just add one drug that you know, can blocks this foot on the brake, as I mentioned before, and bam, you unleash these pre-existing T cells against these presented um, antigens. But that does explain a ton of the benefit that we've um, covered already uh, with this um, so-called immune checkpoint antibody approach. So, so that's fascinating. But I, I think you know, what you're coming to is, well, then, then what, what else can we do with that information, right? And, and so what Steve, I'm sure, talked about with you is, well, we can actually engineer immune cells <laughs> to attack these things um, and you know, basically potentially overwhelm other ways that the immune system tries to, or that, that cancers try to protect themselves from the immune system, um, which is what cell therapy um, of various kinds can do. Uh, so you know, basically we're still in the early days of elaborating this understanding um, that, that yes, the vast majority of cancers um, have these you know, mute alterations that the immune system can actually recognize. Let me just finish with this one very nuanced point. We have learned that some mutated new antigens are much more, uh, will cause a much more robust immune response than others. In other words, they're not all the same in terms of the sort of type of immune response um, that can be elicited. And there's an argument that many have made in terms of thinking about cancer biology and evolution and coexistence you know, of this immune surveillance um, system, that basically the mutations that we end up seeing in diagnosed cancers are ones that aren't particularly well recognized. They don't produce powerful immune responses. The ones that produce powerful immune responses, well, guess what? Those cancers never became cancers in the first place. They got wiped out, yep. um, right? So there's this notion that like, basically you have to be able to fly under the radar, uh, you know, right? And, and you, can, you can build yourself as a cancer cell with a certain repertoire of mutations, provided that none of, none of them are powerfully immunogenic. Yeah. I mean, we could talk about this forever. I'll say a couple more things on it so that we can move on to talk about T cell therapies where I think we're going next. But I, again, I think to put a bow on this, the way I think about this is that, you know, through all of recorded human history, there have been very, very rare reportable incidents of spontaneous regressions of solid organ metastatic, you know, these epithelial tumors, right? Where, you know, Steve mm -hmm. Rosenberg writes about one, which was the the patient who got him to completely change his career. It's the 1960s, he's a resident at the Brigham. A patient comes in who 10 years earlier had been sent home to die with metastatic gastric cancer throughout his liver. You know, they took his stomach out to palliate him and, they, you know, he should have been gone in three months. He shows up 10 years later with a gallbladder that needs removing not a shred of cancer, <laughs> clearly a spontaneous remission. There's an example of someone who made not so much and so significant of an antigen that it got wiped out before it got anywhere. This one actually got all the way to the promised land, but somehow at that point, the immune system said, I recognize it and there are enough of us that recognize it mm -hmm. and we're gonna wipe this thing out. And then what basically happened, and it took 20 years, well, yeah, almost 20 years, right, was figuring out that if you just dump enough interleukin-2, mm -hmm. which is candy to T cells, you're, you're going to pick up the next threshold, which is in melanoma, in renal cell. At the time, we didn't know why, but as you point out, they just have so many freaking uh, mutations that you're bound to just stoichiometrically come up with an antigen that's going to be your lottery ticket. If we just dump enough interleukin-2 on we're going to flip the next threshold. And then, of course, the checkpoint inhibitor takes it one step beyond that, mm -hmm. which is, okay, you clearly don't have enough for on spontaneous uh, mu uh, mutation, um, spontaneous response. You don't even have enough that if I just gave you IL-2, but if I give you a more sophisticated help, turning down the suppressor, now it's going to work. But to really unlock this, right, to basically say we could make 80% of cancer gone. Just gone. Imagine that, right? Like mm -hmm. 80, and by the way, it might be more because maybe you can induce mutations. We're going to come to that in a moment. Right. But if we, if we just wanted to take 80% of cancer deaths off the table, we have to be able to find out 
who is that perfect soldier down there that's really, really, really outnumbered and make, make more of them. And so, yeah. so, so what does that look like? Yeah, well, it's, I mean, just, you know, just to uh, you know, connect the dots from early versions of cell therapy to where we are now, um, in, you know, Steve Rosenberg's work was, you know, so-called adoptive T-cell therapy. Let's not focus on that jargon term so much, but basically doing a surgery to remove a single site of cancer, metastatic cancer, um, removing the immune cells that had found their way into that cancer, um, which turns out actually is some of them are seeing antigens that are, they're specific for. Others are just trafficking through and they're kind of bystanders as it turns out. Uh, but in any case, immune cells you know, don't traffic at high numbers through all cancers, but certain quote unquote immunogenic cancers, yes, they do. Melanoma, again, being you know, near the top of the chart there. Um, and what Steve, Berg, what Steve was doing um, through the 90s, um, and certainly by the time you got there, was taking those immune cells, isolating them from that patient's tumor, and simply expanding them, right? Not, 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 not picking Nothing, them. No, no genetic not, anything. Not, it was just exactly, grow these yeah. tumors. Yeah, grow these tails. Yeah, t- to a number that when he infused them back was, could then, you know, systemically, could then traffic through the body and destroy um, people's cancers. Um, not, not all the time, but a significant minority of patients could be cured that way. Uh, that's still true today. And, and, and by the way, we are right on the verge of that, just that approach alone, no genetic manipulation, becoming an FDA-approved therapy, finally, for melanoma, mm-hmm. uh, which is where you know, uh, Steve had had the most consistent success back in those years. Uh, he, he's tried it in many different cancer types. Now, what's been learned along the way um, is exactly what we've already summarized, which is this, you know, this idea of antigen specificity that you can find basically, you know, this kind of, you know, what is it that the immune system is seeing? Um, these infiltrating immune cells in tumors, what are they, what are they looking at? And then taking that knowledge to basically now begin to engineer uh, immune cells, generally starting with the patient's own immune cells, um, so not coming from tumor anymore, right, but just basically collecting them from the blood. Um, you need a fair number of them. Uh, but because of genetic engineering advances, cell, cellular um, genetic engineering advances, you know, we can now basically you know, swap in, swap out, you know, essentially whatever we like. And in these immune cells that you know, um, we want to direct against cancers, uh, we can basically introduce you know, the, 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 the recognizing piece, if you will. Um, so if we, if we sequence a patient's cancer, uh, which we do just as part of routine standard of care these days, but you do it this, like a little bit deeper, a little bit more um, uh, in yeah, kind of a, a systematic, thorough way. Uh, basically, in, in, in let's go with that number, 80% of patients, you know, we can identify a mutated uh, antigen that will only be in the cancer cells and introduce into the, their immune cells a surface recognizer, if you will. I'm just being vague about the term to not get lost in too much jargon all at once. Um, and then basically just you know dial up that number of cells in the laboratory and then infuse them back like a blood infusion, which is how cell therapy is given. Um, and, and that's... That's the approach that like translates, you know, connects the dots that we that we've covered. We are not doing that today, to be very clear. The cell therapy advances beyond just simply expanding um, the the tumor infiltrating um, immune cells or lymphocytes. Uh, beyond that approach, the engineering that's being done right now are against surface lineage markers. Um, so on B cells for lymphoma primarily, but some leukemias and now multiple myeloma as well. Basically, we are wiping out the cancer cells that arise from that population and the normal ones. Okay, so just to be clear, like that, like so. What, what we're what we were talking about is, you know, a very elegant, you know, very tumor specific um, cell therapy strategy, which you can like readily envision, uh, sort of taking the field, if you will. Uh, but where we are right now in cell engineering is going after common surface markers in cell populations that we can quote unquote afford to get rid of. So eliminating B cells is actually not a great long-term thing, but you can actually survive without your B cells. These are a- uh, antibody producing cells uh, for those who don't you know, track immunology. And, and so, so the, the poster child for this of course is CD19. And yes. as you said, every B cell is walking around with this marker on it. Just, we don't have to get into why it's called CD19. And mm-hmm. when a subset of B cells go on to become lymphoma, that is otherwise unresponsive to other treatments, lo and behold, you could, you know, wipe out, you could basically send in someone that's going to target every CD19. Um, right. And, and you know, you'll get rid of the bad guys, you'll get rid of some good guys. And on balance, it's, it's worth it for sure. Um, 
But yes, what we're talking about here is a next layer of sophistication because for example, if a patient has metastatic lung cancer, it's not an option to wipe out all of the lungs. Um, That's right. But it's also a more complicated problem. Like there are many cancers for which you could completely live without the organ. You don't need your colon. You don't need your breast. You don't need your prostate. You don't even need your pancreas. Um, you'd much, you're would better off being, I mean, I'll give you an example. I think you may remember this. I have a friend um, with Lynch syndrome. It was unbeknownst to him because he was adopted, um, developed colon cancer uh, in midlife. Again, a great surprise when you're 40 to develop a stage three colon cancer, um, but later developed a pancreatic adenocarcinoma. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I sent him to see an excellent uh, doc who I had trained with, and he was inoperable. Uh, mm -hmm. So everybody who is familiar with pancreatic cancer understands inoperable, you know, locally advanced uh, pancreatic cancer is, uh, is a, is a six to 12 month prognosis. Um, but because he had Lynch, I mean, this was 2012, maybe, maybe 2013. Mm. It was just around the time that a paper had come out in the New England Journal of Medicine that had mentioned, Hey, if you have mismatched mutation genes, mm -hmm. you might be mm -hmm. a candidate for this new anti-PD-1. And this story has a happy ending in that sure enough, he got the mm -hmm. anti-PD-1, went into a complete remission, mm -hmm. but now needs insulin because yeah. the yeah. his immune cells destroyed every pancreatic cell in his body, not just the right, cancer, but right. the non-cancer. Do we... Do we not have enough novel proteins on breast cells or prostate cells that we can that the that the CD nineteen yeah. approach is going to work anywhere else? Is that a one hit wonder? Not well. I wouldn't say that, but it's it's true that we're you know these these T cells are so powerful. Um, you you need to find um, you know handles again on the surface uh, that are truly specific for cancer cells. So I, so I was honing in on you know what is truly specific for cancer cells these mutations. Um, yeah, that's and, and it's it's a, it's a big hill to climb that I haven't we haven't gotten into in terms of you know developing you know personalized uh, engineered T cell therapy for the entire global cancer population. That, that's a again, it's a there's a, a cost issue there. There's a technology um, you know issue uh, you know to some degree as well. But in any case, in the meantime, you know what is the field focused on right now? It's trying to you know identify those surface markers proteins. Um, that are truly specific to cancer, and and that's what we've been struggling with because there are other therapeutic modalities that don't require quite as much specificity, where you can direct, you know, like you can direct chemo even, like on the you know an antibody that's on the, on the back end of it has chemotherapy drugs that get you know, sort of ingested by the cancer cell and have a more localized effect. Um, radionuclides, so like like you know really powerful radiation emitters on the back end of such molecules, um, also. And it's clear based on you know precedent, you know clinical data, and now some approved drugs even um, that that are what I'm describing. That there's like a spectrum of selective expression that is not needed there, but for for cell therapy you you need it. Otherwise, again, you're going to obliterate uh, every single uh, cell in the body. And here's the problem: cancers come from us. I mean, right? So so when they when they're you know reading the blueprint, if you will, and and um, and translating certain genes into RNA and then proteins, um, that comes from the same genetic blueprint that you know our normal cells have. Uh, and so, you know, finding such proteins, this is this has been a real, it's not just a technology gap, but it's it's it it it's a it's been a real conundrum. And like feeling blindly and just trying a bunch of things like that, like because of the power of the, the killing potential of these immune cells, um, there's like you know. I mean, the, every constituent in the field has no appetite for that. Um, so this is this has you know been where the field has been anguishing most um, in terms of trying to understand if there's more CD19 like um, opportunities, but on, but on common epithelial cells where we can't you know can't destroy um, you know the, the the normal version. So so we we need to get to this greater specificity. Uh, let me just insert one final thought here, um, which is that the cell engineering field has certainly advanced to the point of being able to create. Um, you know, basically sort of bifunctional recognizing, um, you know, elements. Uh, so these surface, you know, uh, recognizing receptors uh, where basically both of the targets have to be present, right? So like an AND switch, as it's called, like the Boolean AND OR, 
Um, so we're, we're basically, instead of just creating a cell that goes after CD19, you create a cell that goes after CD19 and CD20, and you only ever kill a cell that's got both. Actually, that's not a perfect example because CD19 and CD20 are almost always co-expressed on B cells. But in any case, you get my point that there, you know, there is a fair amount of work going on right now to try to find pairs um, that might, uh, proteins that might only be expressed on, on certain cancers. Uh, that might start to give us um, you know, the opportunity to take this same basic approach that's more readily scalable than the more personalized, while well, you've got this you know, genetic makeup of your cancer cells, uh, and we're gonna zero in on a personalized approach that's specific to your immune system type and to that mutation. Um, again, in, in theory, it can be done, uh, but we have to drive down cost of manufacture. We have to, like, a lot has to happen for that to be remotely feasible um, and economically manageable. Let's go back to Till for a moment. You mentioned that they're on the cusp of um, receiving an FDA approval for the treatment of metastatic melanoma. So again, just to bring people back to what that means, that means a patient with metastatic melanoma who presumably has progressed through all other non-cell therapies um, and still has harvestable tumor. This is a very important feature of Till. You actually have to be able to surgically pull out a large enough sample of a tumor. So a patient, for example, has cancer that has spread to their lung, they have to actually undergo lung surgery and take out a wedge or lobe or whatever amount is necessary. That tumor is taken immediately to the lab where all the lymphocytes that are there are expanded and expanded and expanded. And I forget, I, it's been so long since I've been at it, I think they want to get to at least 10 to the 9. Is that the That's order right. of magnitude? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you want to, you expand this to about 10 to the 9 cells and they're reinfused, usually with interleukin. And again, you're, you're looking for this response. It sounds great in theory. Mm -hmm. Why doesn't it work every single time? You've clearly identified lymphocytes that know how to go there and presumably that's half the battle. Why don't they, why doesn't this work every single time? Yeah, I mean, it's it again. It goes back to defense mechanisms to a degree. I mean, it's it, so there's there you know this. I, I talked about that kind of layering of the onion uh, metaphor before. Basically, there are layers of force fields. I mean, there it, it is the case that there's actually direct mechanisms that can impede killing um, at the tumor cell level. And I talked about like PDL1 being expressed on cancer cell surface. Well, it turns out even intracellular. Um, mechanisms. Uh, so, so the, the way in which interferon, which is an immune system hormone that like basically triggers cell death, it's part part of the killing process. Um, that when CD positive T cells are trying to kill a cell, it's like a virally infected cell, or in this case, a cancer cell. And, and it turns out that that and, you know to become cancers, you know, successfully become cancers in the first place, that you can find direct evidence, certainly in melanoma, of of that cancer that you know in, intracellular pathway itself being altered so that like the that that the immune cells are actually unable to do the killing because the immune, because that cell is no longer sort of sensitive um, to immune cell mediated death um, which is a very nasty little trick and one that can't be overcome just by dumping in uh, more immune cells at least we don't have ev direct evidence that it can uh, this also can cause resistance to, to pd1 antibodies we've demonstrated um, like in melanoma and a handful of other cancer types now but that's like, so you have to start sort of like inside the cell in terms of you know ways in which cancers have evolved an ability to resist immune recognition that is like that they're kind of contending with. Um, but then you've also got you know that recruitment of um, suppressive immune cells that I alluded to before, which like especially very antigenic cancers very commonly you know do that need to do that, um, and you can't overwhelm them just by introducing more CD positive T cells. Uh, by and large. And so in those cancer types where those um, so-called myeloid cells are, are very, very predominant, like this cell therapy has just not taken you know, hold at all. Um, and then there are trafficking issues. Um, in other words, you know, so like uh, basically features of cancer microenvironments, um, some of them related to oxygen tension, some of them related to nutrient availability um, that make it very challenging for immune cells to you know, persist you know, multiply and and do their killing work, um, and so this is you know we we we've known for so such a long time that cancers are cancer cells are metabolically inefficient, um, that they're living in this incredibly harsh environment, um, like as in very low oxygen gradients, 
and and we just you know people didn't really understand like the why of that. I mean, like, like what? right people people the, the, your, what you're describing, of course, comes stems in part from the Warburg effect, which had exactly. always yes. been you yeah. know people had always thought, well, it must be that cancers can't undergo oxidative phosphorylation, right. and that's why they're doing right. this inefficient thing. But to your point, yeah. between yeah. the substrate argument, you know going through reams of glucose leaves you more building blocks, which is what they need more than ATP. Uh, yes. And then on top of that, you're lowering the pH, you're creating this incredibly yes. harsh micro environment. Uh, yep. It seems like there's every reason in the world for, uh, from, from, a, from a, um, a natural selection standpoint for cancer to do that. I, this is my point is that I think it's the, the why of it is that like, well, cancer cells like ultimately figure out how to sufficiently thrive, if you will, in such harsh environments, well, who can't survive in that very harsh environment? Well, immune cells. I mean, right? and so this is the idea that this is all, or much of this has to do with, you know, kind of creating, conditioning this harsh environment as a force field. Um, you know, this is another thing we are not addressing by virtue of just dumping in um, more immune cells. And so, you know, my argument is, you know, that like when I talk about multimodality therapy for cancer, it's you know about targeting those mechanisms that we can address inside the cancer cell. It's about modulating the environment um, metabolically, um, you know, kind of actually even fixing to a degree this oxygen, um, you know, uh, paucity of oxygen in the, in the pockets, uh, you know, of that, um, as well as manipulating these other cell populations like immune cells. Um, and it turns out even like fibroblasts, for example, like get recruited into certain cancers, most notably pancreatic cancer. Um, they seem to be part of the force field against the immune system as well. So we have to kind of knock down the force field. I mean, it's just, it's the Star Wars analogy, right? You've got to take out that the moon <laughs> that generates the, the force field around the Death Star before you, um, you, you send in your fighters to actually try to destroy it. And so, you know, to me, it's, it's you know, we're, we're on the verge of understanding, you know, kind of the hierarchy um, of this biology and how to think about, you know, both diagnosing and then treating at this level. But, but the toolbox has to elaborate, you know, much more completely. It's just, I, in my strongly held view, it's not going to be four therapeutic maneuvers all in column A, right, or four in column D. It's like one from A, one from B, one from C, one from D. That's the type of four drug regimen that's going to eradicate cancer, and it's not going to be one cocktail for all patients. So let's let's dig a little deeper into that in terms of what the next five years might hold for us, right? So if we're sitting down again in five years to talk about the success of the previous five years, what's likely happened, right? So how much further have we gone in immunotherapy, just in straight up activating T cells? either through adoptive cell therapy via genetic engineering to take peripheral blood lymphocytes and turn them into or engineer them into TIL. Let's put that as a category of therapy. Let's talk about other ways to identify checkpoints or uh, checkpoint inhibitors and or um, combat the tumor suppressor cells. So call that the sort of tumor suppressing environment, go after it. How much of it is going to be in the metabolic environment or the mm -hmm. kind of interstitial micro environment that's and, mm -hmm. and targeting the hostility. Um, and then how much of it is going to be inducing mutagenesis? So yeah. again, you know, we, you and I spoke about this probably a couple of years ago and I ended up, I think it, I think I was able to keep it in the book. I know there's always so much pressure. You're trying to chop stuff out of the book. So I don't remember if this finally made it in, but I at least referenced one study that had taken patients, I think with lung cancer, who were, you know, none of them had any PD-1 activity. And then a course of platinum-based chemotherapy all of a sudden rendered a subset of them to now be susceptible to it. In other words, using a conventional chemo increased immunosusceptibility, even though the conventional chemo itself wasn't particularly responsive. Mm -hmm. um, so, so, and again, there's lots of ways to, to go about doing mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, mm -hmm. paradoxically, you could almost imagine taking a cancer cell and exposing it to more mutation forming uh, insult. So, so, and again, I'm sure there's other ideas, but so, so yeah. keeping yeah. the time frame short, which is five years, yeah. what are we going to need to do to double the response rate, the durable response rate? Yeah. Well, I th within a five year horizon, I think what, um, I'd say, well, this is first, let's look backwards briefly. Um, over the past eight years, we have exhaustively tried to find other gas pedals and brakes on immune cells. 
uh, CDA positive T cells most notably. And, and, in, and, and we, we know what those gas pedals and brakes are on those cells. And we have tried drugging those, like uh, typically on top of PD-1 antibody therapy. And that has almost completely systematically failed. Um, now, it doesn't interestingly produce horrific toxicity. In, in other words, the immune system doesn't get so hyperactivated. Like, that's yeah. not the problem. Uh, but it just hasn't moved the needle. Now, I, I will caveat that by saying that um, those approaches have been used um, without any notion of trying to, like, zero in on individual patients and sets of patients for whom, you know, that you know, new immunologic mechanism, you know, might it was hypothesized to be uniquely suited. In other words, we've been throwing a lot of spaghetti at, at the wall and hoping things would stick by just you know treating like a broad array of different cancer patients with absolutely no um, molecular selection. Um, even though there are uh, certainly there all there were and remain hypotheses um, along those lines that you know were never really tested. Um, so anyway, just trying to hyperactivate T cells um, with drugs, uh, I would say we've we've kind of played that out, and it's hard to imagine the only only way to revolutionize that would be what I just alluded to, which is really like really kind of tightening um, or, or sharpening our lens, if you will, um, and focusing on, on, a, on applying those drugs in very specific patient populations. So beyond that, um, I really do see, there's, there's, there's what I would say a, a related class of therapies, the metabolism targeted therapies um, and epigenetic targeted therapies, which have been exploding um, in terms of understanding how you know, the blueprint uh, the genetic blueprint is sort of folded up and unfolded. Um, the regulators of that, um, and the way in which cancers, um, many cancers, like need to figure out how to, you know, co-opt or you know take over um, the the function of some of those um, folders and unfolders. Um, and so there's been a real explosion in novel, uh, very early in development drugs in that class. And it turns out interestingly that that altered metabolism, so the Warburg phenomenon that you alluded to. Um, and the and the regulators of that switch, um, those have been become elucidated in a you know much more complete way in in fairly recent years. Many people would have thought, well, you can't target metabolism and get away with that, right? Because every cell in the body needs to be able to regulate its metabolism in a you know kind of condition dependent way. That's true, but but cancers really do um, they very much depend on this metabolic dysregulation, and and we think that we're on to you know some of the unique regulators that cancers particularly. Um, co-op. So I, I, I would pay a ton of attention. I mean, our group, um, in terms of our therapeutic development work, is is really quite focused in that area. Can you give us a bit more of a sense, Keith, of what that looks like? Yeah. So we we know that, you know, just from a glycolysis standpoint, we know cancer basically is a one-trick pony. Most cancers, right? They're they're turning glucose yeah. into pyruvate all day, yeah. every day, independent yeah. of how much fatty acid is available and independent right. of how much oxygen is available and independent of, they, they, they have perfectly healthy mitochondria. Used, people used to hypothesize the mitochondria were defective, that's why they were doing it. No evidence that that's yep. the case. So yep. what, so let's just play out what you're saying. Um, you could take something really draconian and say, okay, there's an end, so we're not gonna interfere with any enzyme that turns glucose into pyruvate. That would be a bad idea because you have to do that yep. if you're healthy. Yep. But, yep. Um, so where else could you target where you disproportionately hurt a cancer cell without hurting a non-cancer cell that's undergoing glycolysis? Yeah, our group just published a paper on this topic, uh, you know, uh, it's now just five months ago, um, looking quite broadly to understand, like, the re these metabolic regulators um, and which ones cancers seem to selectively use. And, and interestingly, this analysis was focused on uh, immune cell recognition versus lack of recognition, um, and kind of the interplay between these two things. So like, you know, we've already, we already laid out the argument of the idea that cancers, you know, it, it seems in part adopt this inefficient um, metabolic strategy because it allows them to kind of suck in, you know, available nutrients and keep them away even from immune cells. So we were trying to unpack that. And basically, um, it, when you look in an unbiased way at like sort of all of the, you know, gene products that are expressed in cancer cells, um, differently than normal cells. What you see is that it's outside the mitochondria. So inside the mitochondria, I'm 100% with you. Basically, you can't poison that the factory uh, in that way. But it turns out that not only the function of mitochondria, but also just like the, the production of mitochondria. So mitochondrial biogenesis, it's called. Like there's many different mitochondria, or many, many mitochondria per cell. Different cell types you know, need different numbers of them based on their metabolic demands. So cancer cells will actually regulate you know, the amount of mitochondria they have um, through these outside of mitochondria um, uh, 
you know, programs, if you will, uh, transcription vectors in many cases that regulate, you know, kind of the, the, the program in the genome. This is the, the nuclear genome, not the mitochondrial genome, um, that regulate this process. So there's, there's some switches there. Um, and one of those switches um, basically jumped out of this analysis as like the top, you know, differentiator, if you will, um, that expressed in cancers and not um, and others. Now it's a, it's you know, it's the type of molecule that historically has been thought to be challenging to create a drug against. Um, there actually is a proto drug against it that's you know still preclinical, but you know moving forward, we've been collaborating academically with that company, and um, and so early days in terms of knowing whether this is really going to you know kind of bear out. But but these are the types of insights we just didn't have, uh, you know, five and certainly ten years ago. Um, that that there were would be there might be ways to actually kind of laser in on. Um, the regulators of metabolism that cancers are most uh, potentially vulnerable to, and I'm not suggesting these are going to be standalone approaches, as I said before. Right. It's, they're rather, stacked. they're going to potentiate. Yeah. yeah, they're going to potentiate um, these other therapies. They, and let me just kind of make this statement um, to that point. When we look at what drives resistance to both targeted therapy, so those molecules I referred to before, these you know, surface receptor and downstream molecules that have been successful and extend people's um, lives with cancer, and immunotherapy. And we, and we look at common themes in terms of resistance, this metabolic switch, like using oxidative phosphorylation when they weren't using it before, like that's a very common theme in what we call the wow. persister cell population mm. um, in, in both therapy types. And so the idea that you would then potentiate simply what we've already got, you know, right, with this class of therapies go from 20% of cancer patients having long-term survival to, you know, 40%, I'm just making that number up, um, just by figuring out this piece of the puzzle I think that's you know very much in view. Um, now we might have to toggle upstream, downstream, you know, kind of like play with where it is that we're um, ultimately poisoning this uh, you know process, um, and we may have to do it just kind of you know, uh, periodically, like in other words, not not constant like drug exposure all the time to be able to get away with it, which is a common theme in terms of thinking about four drug regimens for cancer. But let's come to your idea of actually um, taking advantage of this <laughs> very delicate. Um, balance, if you will, where cancer cells have, uh, have accumulated genetic alterations to a degree that's supposed to be um, intolerable for a, for a cell's survival, right? In other words, if you can't repair mutations and um, alterations that have been caused, let's say, by acute exposure to something like radiation, for example, where you get a lot of mutations all at once, we have repair mechanisms. But if they don't do their job, then the cell basically has a program by which it commits suicide, um, so, so-called program cell death. And basically, um, cancer cells live dangerously on the edge, if you will, um, in having accumulated these mutations um, in certain cancers, like with your friend, with Lynch. I mean, wow, the number of mutations that accumulate because of, yeah. the de of the defective machinery is just off the charts, like ultraviolet radiation-associated skin cancers, um, also off the charts. And so, in any case, um, the point is that we know that actually if, if you introduce more mutations into those cells, like in the laboratory, like you push them over the edge. Like they just, like they, there's a limit to how much, you know, to what they can handle. So how about, you know, combining that concept with what we were talking about before, immune system recognition of mutated proteins and just say, hey, okay, like you want mutations? And again, going back to my anthropomorphic, you know, now we're talking to the cancer cell. You, you want a lot, lot, lots of mutations because it helps you, you know, dial the combination lock, if you will, and become a cancer. Fine, you know, we're gonna not just double, we're gonna, you know, 10x the number of mutations you have, um, both to increase immune recognition and possibly also just simply push drive them you more towards, towards yeah. cell death. Yeah, um, that concept is really it's behind uh, platinum-based chemotherapy's effectiveness in cancers that that are somewhat deficient in repairing their genomes. Um, right, so that's a, a link that we've known about now therapeutically for a number of years. PARP inhibitors. Uh, that's a that's a DNA damage repair enzyme. PARP um, and inhibiting its function can push certain cancers that are close to the edge, if you will, over the edge. So there's already some direct evidence that we can get that benefit. The immunologic piece, um, that requires um, another layer of complexity, which is that basically you, you would need to introduce the mutations um, and, and ones that are shared across you know, the, the whole population of cancer cells, uh, or if, if not the whole, then, then nearly the whole. So the immune system actually, interestingly, is able to elaborate um, immune responses that become broader, right? So this is, you know, sort of epitope spreading, as it's called, uh, where the immune system latches onto a, a certain antigen in mounting an initial immune response, but then actually can bring in reinforcements that are recognizing um, other antigens and create a more sort of polyclonal response, what was initially a monoclonal response. 
Um, so uh, so that, that's a, a part of innate immune function, but there's pretty good experimental evidence that you have to start with something that's at least shared in you know, 95, 98, maybe even 99% of cancer cells. Wow. So this is where the idea of like, you know, using, let's say, radiation to treat like a single site of metastatic cancer in someone who's got 20 sites, uh, we've tried this um, and it hasn't worked. I mean, there's, there are like very sporadic cases where it actually can like trigger um, a much more profound immune response that's actually like systemic, like that goes after all the tumor sites, but that's quite rare. Again, just for folks to make sure we're following, the reason it would be rare is if you only introduce a whole bunch of mutations to 10% of the tumor, you're, you might generate a new immune response. You might yep. kick the tumor over the edge either by having so many mutations that it all undergoes programmed cell death, or it now finally rises to the level of detection, but that's yep. not sufficient enough. You know, for the across clear, the entire organ, it won't organism. clear the rest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It won't clear the rest of the tumors. And so, so this then, you know, being medical oncology, as you can imagine, this is where my you know mind commonly goes. Then that we have to come up with a. It has to be approach. systemic. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you have to do right. this systemic. To, yeah. Right, and so that that's where there's some really fascinating data um, that a colleague of mine at Mass General is uh, about to publish. And it would suggest that basically you can incubate cancer cells, and by incubate I mean actually in in a living being. <laughs> Um, with mutation-inducing drugs, aka chemotherapy drugs, certain chemotherapy drugs. Um, but to, for that to work, you need to actually be, you have to kind of pin them down with another therapy first, right? So some of the therapies we've talked about already that like actually are effective, um, you know, partially effective for a period of time, you know, months to many months in some cases before resistance might manifest to some of these targeted therapy approaches. If you pin them down with that therapy and incubate in, you know, these chemotherapy drugs that basically start to dial in more and more mutations, um, at least in mouse models, um, it would appear that actually you can you can buy the time that you need to be able to actually introduce new mutations and have that um, trigger immune recognition and make even you know PD one antibody based therapy you know much much more effective. Um, and so so we're going to try that idea in human beings. Um, right, basically taking so-called oncogene-targeted therapy, backbone treatments, um, and then using what are called alkylating agent chemotherapies, which are the ones that can in introduce new mutations most commonly. Um, and, and even at somewhat low doses, it would appear, um, you potentially can introduce the mutations without having some of the deleterious effects that chemotherapy drugs are well known to cause. Keith, I'm going to change gears for a moment only because I know we have a very short clock today relative to how long you and I could normally speak. Um, and I want to talk about another very important topic. So to introduce it, let me share with you some stats that you know better than I do, but I'll let you interpret the stats for the listener. If you take a person with stage three colon cancer, so this person has cancer in their colon, it's even spread to the lymph nodes of the colon, but to the visible eye, it has spread no further and to, there's no radiographic evidence that it's anywhere else. You're going to put that patient on a fancy regimen of chemotherapy. I don't have to spell out full fox and all that stuff, but there's a, there's a regimen of chemotherapy you'd put that patient on. How many of those patients are going to be alive in five years? 60, 70% of them? Yeah, that's about right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it, uh, yeah, again, it all depends on the size yeah, of the initial yeah. tumor and yeah. other features, but that's about right. Yeah. Yeah. Let's now take that same patient in a way, except he also has cancer that has spread to his liver. Yeah. So... You're going to go ahead and cut the colon out, take those lymph nodes out. But on the CT scan, you're going to notice that he's also got metastatic cancer. So one of them is stage three, one of them is stage four. We're going to give that stage four patient the same chemotherapy. We're going to give them the same drugs. But in five years, somewhere between none and a few percent of those patients will yeah, be alive. Yeah, yeah. And if you wait to 10 yeah. years, it's yeah. none. Yeah, yeah. What's a decent explanation for that observation? Which, by the way, if we had more time, we could tell the same story for every cancer, basically. Yeah, yeah. Like, in other words, what I refer to as microscopic residual disease. Like, why, why, why is it that we're actually able to eradicate microscopic residual disease with the same drugs that that don't do the job um, when you have macro disease? Ugh. Yeah. yeah right. like, well, in other words, saying, why does yeah, it work yeah. when you have hundreds of millions or billions of cells not all clumped together but sort of diffuse? Yeah. But when you have like a hundred billion cells and they're yes, like in exactly. big yeah, visible yeah. clumps, the same yeah. drugs just fail. Yep. Yeah. So there's 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 
you know, I would say two prevailing explanations. Uh, there, are, there are hypotheses, I mean, frankly, because we, they're, they'll become explanations once we actually, you know, connect the dots and really, you know, prove that we can, you know, demonstrate our knowledge by curing more patients with this. Um, so one is basically just a clonal heterogeneity concept. So basically as cancers evolve, um, we used to think that cancer cells were kind of identical clones of one another, like that, like they're just like, you know, just a massive number of absolutely identical cells. Um, that in the beginnings of cancer, that is largely true. Um, but as cancers continue to evolve um, in our bodies, uh, they actually keep mutating. Um, and so you start establishing subclones. I mean, and like you can have a dominant subclone. That's typically the case. Like that might even be, you know, 99% of cells. Um, and then in that remaining 1%, you might have 10, 20 subclones. Um, we've like, proven now that that certain therapies actually are able to pick off the 99%. They leave the 1% or, and then somewhere in that 1% is a clone that has a resistance mutation, like already in it to the drug that we're giving. Um, so there's a clonal heterogeneity, you know, um, you know, kind of uh, hypothesis that I would say is, is quite strong at this point because of some of the evidence I just alluded to, that that's a big part of the problem. If you nip it in the bud, if you will, with offering the same therapy when there's not so much clonal heterogeneity, um, that's, that's, that represents a curative opportunity. And so when I was talking before about these um, so-called oncogene targeted therapies, which is not all of the targeted therapy successes we've had, but the ones that go after these mutated, um, activated um, proteins on you know those growth factor receptors and downstream ones in particular um, it's very clear that you can't you can cure a trivial fraction of patients with overt metastatic disease and you can cure a pretty substantial fraction of patients in the so-called adjuvant setting so microscopic residual disease setting and and so so we, we have direct evidence that this phenomenon occurs but but uh, but you're asking the why question it's we think some contribution or some part explanation from having to do with you know lack of clonal heterogeneity. The other is the secondary immune response concept, right? That basically all successful curative cancer therapies actually do trigger immune recognition um, through what's referred to as immunogenic cell death. So that you're killing the cells directly with your drugs, um, but that basically the, with the mop-up work, if you will, of actually eradicating every last single cell is, an, is the immune system's job. Um, it's a concept that was first um, introduced uh, with when we had just you know, these conventional chemotherapy drugs from the 1900s, um, and and now we actually have more and more evidence that our you know sort of more elegant molecularly targeted drugs actually engender these types of you know like you know better immune system recognition phenomena um, as part of their mechanism of action, and and I, I and because we've de directly demonstrated that like better immune recognition in you know in patients who are receiving these therapies, looking at biopsies compared to uh, pre-treatment, and that that happens rather quickly. Um, you know, I think it's reasonable to then, you know, like overlay that on top and say, well, yeah, no, it, it, it's it's you, it's extending your spontaneous remission, you know, kind of um, starting point uh, from a while ago in discussion, uh, that basically you're, you're allowing this kind of tipping point phenomenon to occur. Yes, you're directly killing cells with these drugs, that's true, but the eradication piece. Yeah. Um, you know, is is uh, is ultimately an immune system, and I think there's kind of a hybrid there too, right, Keith? Which is that in the in the micro metastases environment, in the adjuvant setting, you have less capacity for the tumor to create the hostile environment in which yes. to yes. impair the immune system from mopping up the damage. So it's it's all it all favors keeping the cancer cell on its heels, and the way to do that is to just have as little of them as possible is going to increase our odds. You still That's have right. to win. You, I mean, you still have to yeah. kill because if you don't, it will get back onto its toes. That's right. And and this is, I mean, this is what we're talking about is behind this, you know, massive like wave of enthusiasm. Um, and it's 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 um, legitimate enthusiasm, not hype. That early detection is going to allow our same toolbox of drugs to be massively more effective. Um, so early detection. Uh, Which, by know, the, how, that, that's you, the that's the only reason I posed the question, right? Like that yeah, that's exactly you're, yeah, you're, you're taking the yeah, cue and you're running yeah, with it, yeah. right? Because we're t we're pretty terrible at that, uh, in, in, as as it stands right now. Um, so you know, it, as I think many um, uh, of your audience know, basically we can only screen. We only have real direct evidence of effective screening for a few 
cancer types. Um, I mean, cervical cancer for sure, but we could also like hopefully eradicate cervical cancer by getting everybody vaccinated. HPV vaccine. Um, yeah. Eventually, exactly. Um, but but cervical cancer screening, um, you know, uh, absent a vaccine is is quite effective. So um, so that's one. Breast cancer for sure. We can cut the risk of breast cancer death by about a third um, with mammography. But that's not that's not a very inspiring number. I mean, I absolutely would suggest that everyone who's eligible who you care about, you should, um, you know, strongly insist that they get mammograms. Colonoscopy um, and other less invasive means of detecting colon cancer can reduce risk of colon cancer death by about 25 to 30 percent ballpark. I mean, the, the, best, the most optimistic estimates would be about a third um, also. Um, and I, there again, I'd say, well, that's, that's a real number. I mean, I, you know, I, I've had my first colonoscopy and I'll keep doing them, uh, but that's not, that, that isn't, you know, um, again, particularly inspiring. And despite, you know, lots of effort and uh, I'd say lots of controversy, prostate cancer screening is, is really quite poor. I mean, really, it's like kind of a, it's a, it's almost like just, you know, um, non-randomly assigning people to get prostate biopsies, right? As, you know, getting PSA tests, basically. It's, it's, it's not a great way of detecting um, cancers and certainly not potentially dangerous prostate cancers. But I would add something to that, Keith, which is that all of those three, the three last ones, which are three big cancers, right? Those are three yeah. of your big yeah. five. Um, yeah. They all have something in common. So if you look at mammography, infrequent colonoscopy, and PSA, I would make a case that all of those are not great screens by themselves. Yeah. And I'm sure you would agree, right? So in other words, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. People often confuse, and unfortunately this is true of physicians and policymakers more than it is patients, because I think the patients are looking to those of us who think about this for input. Patients yeah. confuse, or policymakers rather, and physicians confuse the statistics you rattled off as proof positive that early screening doesn't justify the cost. Yeah, A different yeah. way to say it is, no, mammography used in isolation, which has its blind spots is not a monotherapy. Yep. PSA by itself, as you said, is shy of a random number generator. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that adding ultrasound or MRI to right. the breast right. surveillance program won't right. dramatically by stacking tests with different sensitivities and specificities, right? Mm -hmm. Mammography, exceptional for small calcified lesions, uh, works poorly in hyperglandular tissue, right? The exact opposite is true with the MRI. Uh, similarly, with the PSA by itself, virtually meaningless, but PSA density, PSA velocity now adds much more uh, specificity. Yes. Uh, furthermore, you start to add things like a 4K, and if the risk is high enough, you get um, you know, multi-parametric MRI. I'll, t I'll tell you this, Keith, I mean, I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but I think, again, just for listeners, in 10 years, I have not had one patient get a prostate biopsy that wasn't warranted. And I'm, I'm not a superstar. It's not like I've, I've got some, right, no, right, right, right. it's just that just, we're, yeah. we're doing yeah. this, we're not just using PSA, right? Yep. Sometimes we've had patients who only get picked up on PSA velocity. Their PSA is not high mm -hmm. enough to trigger the 4K. Mm -hmm. No one would go and do anything based on their, you know, so, so I, I think I get a little frustrated when the medical community that's anti-early screening or, or screening and early detection poo-poos it based on what I still think are impressive numbers, the number you, you state, because yeah. that's sort of like saying, you know, um, you know, there's too many fatalities in cars we shouldn't drive. Right. It's, it's just it just doesn't right. make any sense right. it's like yeah there right. are fatalities right. in driving right. let's figure out ways right. to drive better you can put right. a seat belt on you could not right. drink while driving and right. you could mind the speed limit that's a totally different situation than saying it's you know we're going to abandon all those things so um yeah. anyway th this oh, is no, why no, i no, think I, I, yeah yeah, yeah. You're, you know, you're reminding me that I like in my world uh you know being an oncologist I like I don't have to contend with that the community you're referring to. That's right. right? So, I mean, I, I take those numbers as being uh, like absolute support and endorsement. But part of what I'm getting at is the remaining unmet need, yeah. right? And, it, and it's into that massive unmet need that there has been just an enormous advance in terms of methods for detecting like, you know, single alleles, uh, single uh, fragments of genes um, in the bloodstream. Uh, so it turns out that, that normal cells shed DNA, 
um, in the in the bloodstream. Uh, it is digested and broken down, you know, reasonably quickly, uh, but not immediately. Um, cancer cells do this also, uh, as it turns out. Um, and the more cancer you have in your body, of course, the, the more um, well, maybe maybe that's not so obvious, but it is true uh, that the more cancer that is in the body, the the more um, of the copies of cancer DNA that will actually be shed in the bloodstream. But sequencing technologies have advanced um, to a degree that now, you know, from a single 10 milliliter tube of blood, and particularly one collected over time, so kind of analogous to your PS, your uh, PSA velocity example, where you're sampling mul at multiple time points. If you sample at multiple time points now and subject those, um, I don't mean just to the methods that are, you know, being early or, or you know are being commercialized now, but but are being commercialized. I mean, since we talked four years ago. What, what felt like you know very much a research method is now emerging as a, a real clinical option. There's methods now that can find cancers at, at, an, at an earlier point and a broad array of cancers, like way beyond just the, two, the cancer types that we're talking about. I mean, the ones for which we have screening methods, I mean. Um, so really, you know, you know almost pan-cancer tests. But in R&D mode right behind them are you know, 10x, 100x more sensitive methods that are, are absolutely going to move the needle in terms of our ability to find cancers um, at a microscopic point. Um, now, here's the problem. Uh, so the, the problem is at a microscopic point, uh, right, what do you do? I mean, right, you, where do you direct the scalpel? I mean, this is, this is a fundamental conundrum. So you overlay on top of what I just described the fact that on, that, on the circulating tumor DNA, um, as it's called, you can actually do more than just sequence, you know, for mutations to find that it's circulating tumor DNA as opposed to normal DNA. You can also look at what are called methylation patterns, which is, has to do with this kind of like folding and unfolding of the blueprint. Um, these, these molecular modifications that, that, that exist in certain cell types. Um, and basically, if you find, you know, mutated sequence of DNA, and it's got the methylation pattern of a colon epithelial cell, Guess what cancer you probably have, right? So, so, and that, and while you can't direct the scalpel right away, obviously you can do a colonoscopy. Um, but similarly for you know breast cancers and others, where you can then start to focus your attention, right, with with imaging analysis to try to you know detect the cancer. Maybe not the moment that the blood test is positive. Maybe it's going to take you six months, twelve months, eighteen months of continued surveillance, and then you'll find it at a much earlier point than you ever would have found it, you know, based on our other methods. Um, so that's one. You know, sort of paradigm, and that, that's where we are right now with the adoption, early adoption of you know uh, methods as they exist now that are getting rapidly better in terms of increased sensitivity. So there's been a real explosion in terms of investment in this area, and now um, scale up of technologies that are you know commercially relevant. Um, but the other concept I wanted to just kind of weave in here is I think where you kind of started this um, set of questions, which is that basically you know in certain instances we're going to find. You know, targetable mutations, and you know, and by that I mean with you know drugs or with immunotherapies, where basically you know we'd say, well, look, we can't, we see it in the blood. We actually, with our best available scanning technology, we can't actually see it in a way to direct a scalpel, but we actually know what drug to give you to eradicate your trivial amount of cancer, um, right? You know, using the analogy that we we started with here, which is like clinically overt metastatic disease versus you know, microscopic disease that remains after surgery, the AKA adjuvant setting. Um, but now finding cancer is at a point where there's many fewer of these cells and where, you know, the defense mechanisms of force fields, the heterogeneity that we talked about before don't exist. And so this is, I mean, a real reason for optimism. I should just highlight that there's two applications here. Um, one is actually to do um, much more precise therapy in the post-surgical setting. So really figuring out, you know, right after surgery, who still has microscopic disease in them? Who doesn't? Now, that, that's a much easier problem. I mean, I, I actually yes, talked with Max yes. Dean about that problem, and yes. he's one of the pioneers in that field. And, of course, yes, right. not to minimize the, 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 the amazing breakthroughs there, but there you know what you're looking for, right? You've taken that's out right. the patient's lung cancer. Precisely. You know exactly yeah. how that lung cancer differs from a non-cancer lung cell, and you're out there looking, and you're right. I mean, this now becomes the most elegant way for... Uh, post-treatment surveillance, but yeah, exactly. it's it's what we started with that is the much more difficult problem, and frankly, the most important problem. I mean, yeah. if you solve That's this right. problem, I, I I don't know that the other things matter anymore, right? Oh, like no, if, no, you solve, if you solve if you solve this problem, yeah. you 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 win the game. 
Yeah, completely. No, yeah, we just we've just we've always been stuck in this mode in cancer research and therapeutic development. Kind of start with the worst case scenario, if you will, yeah. right? Yeah. You know, and um, and then learning. That yeah, the and same, that's where you have to learn. Yeah, yeah. Right. yeah, that's right. And that the same therapies that are somewhat effective in the overt metastatic setting are much more effective in the so-called adjuvant or post-surgical setting. And I, we have every reason to believe they're going to be at least as effective, arguably more, when we're down to one, you know, like two logs, three logs, even fewer cells. Um, at the time that we're uh, finding and intercepting the cancer, when the immune system is still quite competent, is still actually you know doing you know much of its job. So what's the what's the state of the uh, of the market today, Keith, in, in terms of um, uh, tests that that people listening to this can actually get as part of a a, a cancer screening uh, protocol? So so yeah, so Grail yeah. has a commercially available kit. Yeah. Uh, it's yeah. you know it's not over the counter. You need to get it through a physician. Um, yeah. What, what are some other tests out there? And in your view, how close are we to these tests being an imperative part of cancer screening? Yeah, I, I, I think we're not quite at the imperative point, but we're, uh, we're certainly at the point where I would say it's reasonable to get a test. I mean, right, if you consider yourself an early adopter yep. and you know who you are, um, it's reasonable to get a test. Um, it's, you know, and, and, and just quickly to answer your question, uh, the first part of your question, uh, there's a test that was initially developed by a company called Thrive that was acquired by Exact, um, and they 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 have a commercially available test as well. And then another company called Delphi um, have a commercially available test, which are all all have performance characteristics that are, you know, in the same realm um, in terms of supporting uh, you know their their current clinical use. Uh, but here's the concern um, that many people have, which is um, that basically we're at a state in the field where finding people who are blood positive, blood test positive, um, could lead to a large degree of anxiety in terms of then you do, you know, standard standard radiographic assessment, you don't find the problem. And that and that basically the medical community, and because we're not talking about oncologists you know, yep. who are doing the tests, right? So um, the medical community um, really hasn't had time to really kind of work out the kinks of like, how do we manage this situation? And so you can almost argue that there need to be, you know, generalists who you know kind of really develop expertise, you know, kind of content knowledge, yeah. have a network of specialists that they can work with to be you know to be able to kind of catch these patients. Um, and these tests were launched, you know, before that was really created. So that, that's just my PSA here, yeah, yeah. my public service announcement <laughs> in terms of um, the fact that you just like you know if you just get a test and you're not in the hands of someone who can you know kind of manage. Um, a positive test. Uh, I think that 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 is at least anxiety provoking. But the, and the technology will is is I mean, again it's we we've uh, with collaborators of ours uh, we've actually been doing like direct head to head comparison uh, you know kind of analyses like of how much lower can we go in terms of you know amount of of uh, tumor DNA in the blood that can be detected with you know what are currently R and D methods but are readily scalable. Um, we're really at a hundred x better. I mean, it's like it, it, this is it's and, you know that it's at that point it, you're talking about a finger drop of blood if you're a hundred x yeah, better well, than ten ml. Well, you mean? Yeah, but okay, that's true. You could take it in that direction, but we actually you we, would say we, no, stay with ten or twenty ml, 10 ml and we are exactly. way more sensitive. Yes. Oh, exactly. Yes, exactly. Yes. Okay. I mean, right. So that so that's the point, and and then and then do serial analyses, right? Yeah. Do multiple, you know, so like in the in. Go with high risk populations to prove this point, if you like. But so we 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 can readily envision how it is that we basically start to capture you know a much bigger um, uh, section of the population. It's it's a little hard to estimate right now, basically, until we do more studies. What's differentiating these companies? So if you just look at Delphi yeah. and Grail, and, and is it the? I mean, you know, so sort of so Grail to me, I have no interest. I have no uh, uh, affiliation sure. with any of these companies. Right. We use Grail right. in our patients. Sure. Um, when we do, we don't do this in everybody for exactly the reasons you've stated. I, you got to be able to tolerate the, uh, the the noise that may come of these tests. That's sort of our view of aggressive cancer screening in general. But but when we use it, we do use Grail, and that's largely based on the affiliation with Illumina, right? Which is yep. if you've got the best sequencing company in the world that created the engine for this thing, then I mean yep. that that sort of makes sense to me. But but what else differentiates these companies? Yeah, it's basically uh, to. I mean, there's three three kind of aspects to circulating tumor DNA that we we now know. Um, if you pay maximal attention to, you can increase your sensitivity. You can find, you know, find more uh, cancers. So I started with mutations. That's like that's kind of the you know, first principle. Then comes the so-called fragment length. So fragmentomics, if you will, or its own field. 
uh, separate from you know uh, first generation genomics. Um, and that uh, and and you know Delphi basically like basically came out of that scientific discovery that circulating tumor DNA basically um, comes in different fragment sizes um, than normal cell uh, DNA, and that that basically. It, this is a uh, kind of population phenomenon. You're measuring multiple, well, many, many um, circulating DNA fragments um, and tuning your algorithm uh, ultimately to be able to kind of find the sweet spot of differentiation. That that is that's definitely part of the formula, and I, I would argue that just everybody's going to rise to that, um, you know, uh, inclusion of that method, and then that methylation yep. um, aspect that I talked about before. That that that's that's the other feature that has been a differentiator um, in terms of kind of the, the first marketed products um, in this class, um, even across these three companies. But there are 10 more companies coming right behind. So basically, the, the first one is kind of not valuable for pan screening because that's, that's, your, that's how you're checking for recurrence when you know the mutation, right? I mean, we're not going to be able to screen people on the basis of guessing cancer mutations, are we? Uh, no, no. Some would argue we can. I mean, as the cost of sequencing continues to nosedive, um, believe it or not, um, still still going down uh, lower and lower uh, cost, uh, you know, per you know mm -hmm. unit of um, of sequencing done. You know, there were there are some who argue actually, no, no. We just we go after you know pick a number. You know, the thousand most common cancer mutations, the ten thousand most common, the hundred thousand most common cancer mutations. Yeah, I mean, I guess if you had KRAS and you had, like, if you, you, you know, know. And P53. Yeah, yeah P53 you know, and, yeah, yeah BRAS. Yeah, right, which is, P53 is mutated in 50% in of all cancers. Now it turns out the there problem are is hundreds of different P53 exactly, mutations. Exactly, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a big gene. But it, but but still, so this, the, the people used to object to that concept yeah. based just on a sequencing cost, yeah. um, you know, uh, uh, argument. But that, that, I think, is becoming less and less relevant. So yeah, so that that first feature doesn't require that customization, which is what's being done in the post-surgical setting. You alluded yeah. to that, but just to make sure that people understand that that's that that tech. Yeah. When Good you point. know what mutations exist in the resected tumor, it does allow you to create very very sensitive tests for that patient, and that's what's being done I mean, commercially. Are these bespoke um, assays uh, based on what comes out uh, in the surgical specimen? But when you don't know what you're looking for, the argument is if you do enough sequencing. Um, you, you, you'll find them. Which companies are do? Are there companies, or is that all done in the lab right now? Are there are there companies that are actually taking? No. It's not. It's not yet commercialized. No, no. But it. I mean, but it's. This is like. There's a real. I mean, I mentioned this briefly before. There's just a a real scale up in investment in this area, which is incredibly heartening to see. Yeah. I mean, I used to complain for so much of my career about the fact that diagnostics just didn't get the same investment that therapeutics got because the you know, sure. return on investment yeah. just fundamentally different, like, you know, fundamentally different um, between the two domains. And yet as clinicians, like, we, we need the diagnostics. We can't even we can't even think about therapeutics until we, you know. Well, that's that's the irony of it, right, is if people talk about, oh, we'd really love to lower healthcare costs. Yeah. yeah. You need earlier and better diagnostics. Yeah, right. Exactly. Like, it's just, it's, just, it's just such a no-brainer right. that you uh, yeah, could, you know, yeah. It's, I think it's wise to be upset about the cost of oncology therapeutics that are adding yeah. no value. But right. you spend a tenth of that on the diagnostics, you make that problem right. irrelevant. Exactly right. That's right. And and then the durations of therapy that we need to give people yep. you know, to have curative outcome. I mean, like you, you solve so yeah, many yeah. problems. You, you just say, we're, we're, we're yeah. turning this into yeah. a lock and key model from exactly. diagnostic to therapeutic. Keith, right. we're just about out of time. So I want to kind of end with, with, a, with a question that you may not be able to answer, but it's worth asking anyway. Um, you know, I think of you and, and, and people I know like you as the most remarkable, you know, oncology advocates, meaning I know that if one of my patients comes down with uh, cancer, I can call you up and say, Keith, I've got this woman. It's a very unusual breast cancer. It's, you know, it's it's her two new positive, but ERPR negative. There's something funky about it going on. Who do you like? Who should she be mm -hmm, seeing? Mm -hmm. um, and, 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 and let's say there's another situation where a traditional therapy is failing and, and you know, you're going to point me in the direction of, um, mm -hmm. of where, to, where there's a clinical trial that's promising, mm -hmm. not just a phase mm -hmm. one that's like probably got no hope, but here's a, here's a phase two that really has some hope. Okay, so like there should be an entire industry of Keith Flaherty's who are there to be consulted by um, families who find themselves in this, in this situation. Because again, we come back to how we started this discussion. There's nobody listening to us right now or watching us right now mm -hmm. who 
hasn't been touched or will not be touched by cancer. And even if it's a cancer that ultimately doesn't kill them, which again, in about half the cases, it won't actually kill you, you will need help navigating the system. And the disparity in cancer care in this country, uh, and probably in most countries, is significant. And therefore, it does matter who you know. It does matter which expert points you to the best treatment center. So because I can't clone Keith and a dozen other people that I know that I can pick up the phone and call, what, what does that look like? I mean, what, what, what can somebody do when they, when they get that bad news? This drives me crazy, uh, what you're talking about, in terms of access to expert opinion um, when you need expert opinion, and, and particularly for complex, unique um, outlier cases, if you will. And, and, we're, and you don't know as a patient or a family member whether you're you know, um, dealing with a middle-of-the-road case, right? How, how would you know? Yeah. Um, and, and this is where um, basically, so f first off, like we, we, we need to pool our insights, if you will, right? Like, like, like break down the silos of you know, hospitals and centers and universities and whatever, um, and pull our, you know, kind of, you know, opinions. Uh, that's kind of point number one. Point number two is we need to leverage technology for this purpose. Like this is, I mean, this I, like people get all excited about artificial intelligence mm. in terms of its, you know, its in, how it's informing, you know, chemistry advances and and the like. And 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 you know, I'm excited about those things too. But but and, and then other aspects of you know biology discovery and all that. But this is the this is the most obvious use basically, right? Is that you essentially you you start to you know like build the database essentially of of opinions um, that you know that like I and others you know offer to specific cancer cases based on certain aspects of their diagnosis, right? And and the patterns are like. These are not hard for a machine to, to figure yeah. out. I mean, a human can figure it out. No, it's just, it's sort of codifying what you do what you do very easily as the yes. teaching set for the AI. Exactly. And what I'm getting at is within the 95% you know boundary of you know of you know kind of typical cases. Um, basically, you, you I mean, you really could you could the decision support can really be based on you know the last hundred cases that I and my you know yep. other melanoma colleagues have seen that are you know just like this, um, and then the edge cases is where we need to apply our specific attention, right? And there I think there are actually enough of us to yep. handle the edge cases. Um, uh, the problem is that we like the way our system works is like nobody knows what their complexity of their diagnosis is, so they're right. So they basically are, are like everybody's seeking you know the same level of care and and you know sort of decision making. Um, Without that understanding, and and I we can get way ahead of this, and 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 be transparent in explaining, like, look, you know, here's why we're saying you've got a very typical case. We have a ton of outcome data. Yep. We you know we know we know what therapy um, is is the very best, and then like you know the issue of like therapeutic access and like investigational therapies that are you know crossing the divide and are showing real responses in real human beings and should be considered you know as a certain priority, maybe not the top priority, but a backup option or something. That's also <laughs> Like that is like that is just not um, rocket science, um, and you shouldn't have to get on an airplane and never go see anybody. But even on the Zoom screen, I mean, honestly, this is we we are so inefficient in terms of how it is that we disseminate information. Um, it drives me crazy, and um, there are very few entities, but are few um, that are working on this problem and and kind of see it this way. This is you throw some technology at this problem, I think this this goes away. So what is the best thing that one could do now? What are, what are the companies that are out there that are trying to do this now that are reputable in your mind? Yeah, I mean, N of One's been at this for a long time and they, this is still a model that they're, um, I think, quite good at, um, but, but not the accumulating of the database and the, you yeah. know, kind of, again, figuring out how to, you know, um, you, know, uh, you know, kind of focus attention, if you will. Um, there's a company I know called Xcures that's doing um, exactly this kind of work. Mm -hmm. I mean, but it's still, it's still at the, Helping individual patients navigate level right now. Yep. What I'm, you know, the the, the yeah, next it's, turn it's, of the crank. it's not the full. The, it's not the yeah. full insight yeah. machine. That's yeah. right. That's right. Yeah, but that, but it's going to come. I mean, I I mean, this is another area that is like investment. Yeah. You know, under under invested. Um, and I would really, I mean, I I would really like to see this because we we otherwise, as you know, we're kind of blowing the bank on a very efficient um, system as it stands right now, and it's not it's not scalable. Certainly not globally scalable. Well, Keith, this was this was fantastic. Uh, obviously, we're going to sit down in four years again and <laughs> and and talk about the the last four years, which will be going forward from here. And um, uh, I I don't know. I, I have to say, I find myself quite optimistic um, about 
what I see happening. Um, and, um, I, I think, I think we'll be talking about some big wins in four years. Again, I don't think we're cu quote unquote curing cancer. Um, but I think we're going to get a lot better at detecting it earlier, which gets people yeah. into a treatment pipeline sooner. Um, right. and I think we're going to continue to see probably incremental ways to harness the immune system. That's probably where I, I see a lot of optimism. And again, I think that's in combination with other traditional therapies and non-traditional therapies, such as the metabolic ones you mentioned. Yeah, the, the good news is that the, the technology curve continues to bend upward, right? And so we talked about sequencing technology as an example there, but cell engineering advances, ability to take new molecular targets and rapidly cycle that through to you know new drugs, um, small molecules, antibodies, the like. Um, all of these advances are converging in a way that if we keep talking at four-year increments, the pace of progress is going to be like substantially greater per unit time. We've already witnessed that. I mean, it's, there's no question that for your increments over my career, that's, that's been true. Um, it's reflected just in, in approval of drugs by the FDA uh, for cancer. But, but now the convergence of diagnostics and therapeutics, um, that's what's finally coming into view. Um, that, 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 that piece has really, I would say, been largely missing. Um, but you know, if you link up all that we talked about today, I think like, that's, that's the take home message really, is it's, it's the crossing of those wires that's what's really gonna massively get us um, towards the path of having many, a much, much, much higher percentage of patients who are 10 year survivors to use that benchmark again. Yeah. Well, Keith, thanks again. It's been great speaking with you. And I, I, I know we'll speak a lot more in the next four years, but I look forward to hosting you again back in four years and having the, uh, the next increment of time discussion. Absolutely. Really enjoyed it. Be well.